we'd come across a couple more rhino arts in this area, maybe even a herd of buffalo. We found some signs of quite a large herd of buffalo. I think you were with Trish and a, a giraffe earlier, and now uh, some zebra. Again, we wonder about that band name, but also something that you could expect to see out here, or we could expect to see, is some giraffe and all of these animals together just for, for safety. But no real concerns this morning on that one. Just behind mom you see an oxpecker, red bull oxpecker. But almost that little bit of a gingery mane on that youngster that you've got in picture there now with its, its head down. It's disappearing now that I've said that. No real wind as of yet. We're starting to come into almost spring on the 1st of September. But now wind's starting to die down. August is usually typically quite a windy month, but a little bit of a breeze is coming onto our backs, all feeding into the wind again. So they can smell predators. We actually came straight back to that spot where we left those three young male lions yesterday, but they had disappeared. Well, Keep a lookout for them as well. We're not too far from that area and see if anything helps us find them. And a, a big herd of animals like this, the impala, wildebeest, and zebra can all help us find predators like lions, even cheetah out here. It's been a while since we found that mom with her two little youngsters. So we'll definitely keep a lookout for them this morning. You can hear all the birds in the background starting to, to come alive this morning. And I have a feeling it's going to be a beautiful day, nice warm day. You can hear that very scratchy call of the ox picker as well now in front of us. A tree. Jumbo Jumbo and hello hello everybody a good morning from the Masimara we got a very huge raptor for you on that bosque tree and you can see the beautiful savanna right there one more time Jumbo everybody and my name is David and on camera with me this morning is Bungay Hi, Bungay. We are very lucky to start with one of the largest birds of prey in East Africa. And this one here is a Marshall Eagle. To me, it's the largest eagle that we got in this area. And just look at her. My guess is what she's trying to do now is just to scan for food because she's patched right on top of that tree and they will catch anything from mammals to other smaller birds and sometimes they even catch reptiles. <coughs> Excuse me. So look at the background there of the beautiful savanna and way in the background that is the Masimara. Thank you very much to hear you all of my green shuka, which is always my signature. When the temperatures are cold, I will never miss to have the shuka on me. It helps me to identify myself with the green savanna of the Masimara. This tree here is called Boskia tree or Bosiae, and it's one tree that remains green all around the area. Now, in general, my show egos, you'll see them solitary. You rarely see them in twos. But when they're mating or when they're trying to raise some chicks, you might see two together. But most eagles are always solitary, and the martial eagle is not an exception. 
It's very similar to another big eagle that you call a crown eagle, but crown eagles in general, you'll get them in thicket or very dense forests. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, should you have any questions or comments, please send them through. You can tweet CGTN World or hashtag World Earth. Hashtag CGTN World or hashtag World Earth. For the youngsters also, you can talk us to on email. Kids questions at worldearth.tv. We are coming to you live so you can engage us and we will answer you or talk to you in real time. These eagles, the females are always slightly larger than the males and <laughs> Christian speaker saying these martial eagles are like the leopards of the sky. I'll tell you yes, I agree with you because when you look at them, the kind of game, the kind of animals they hunt or their prey is always very large. Look at the spots and see the white head. I would still say she's a bit young. And I was saying earlier that it's difficult to tell, I mean, from a distance, male from a female, unless you see them together. But the females being slightly larger in size than the males, we have noticed that the females will hunt big game. Big game, I'm talking of even baby impalas. We have seen them going for smaller birds, and sometimes they even go for reptiles. The last best hunt I saw with a martial eagle was a martial eagle going for a monitor lizard. So they remain high, like where she's perched now, and they soar up in the sky, and then what they do, they just stoop down to the aquarium, and because they're always like four to five kilos, they just land on their prey, and that weight plus the trauma is enough to subdue their prey. Females hunt bigger prey than the males in general, by virtue of them being big and stronger. I'm very impressed because she's not going anywhere. And she's very calm, but more often than not, most of these eagles, when you see them or when you come close to them, they normally tend to fly away. Very entertained uh, by this eagle. I'll move on maybe and try and look for some cats. Wow, David, what an awesome martial eagle sighting. We actually briefly saw one yesterday, but it doesn't sound like it's as good as yours. However, we don't have a bird. We have got an elephant, which is the animal that I can only seem to find on safaris. My name is Taylor McCurdy, and on camera with me today is Sebastian Rodriguez, which is part of the, part of the greater Kruger ecosystem. There's actually around us, but that is looks like the biggest one over there, I think. I'm not sure because he's facing the opposite way. But that's okay. Oh no, he's lifted his tail. I wonder what's going to happen next. Oh no, back down it goes. Phew, we dodged a bullet there. So we just found the, uh, the elephant bulls that have been roaming around. It was a great interaction between bulls and two different breeding herds yesterday at Nglovu Dam. And I'm sure you've heard me say that dam's name a few times. Uh, that's because it's one of the most prominent watering holes. So they'll probably loop back around and get there this afternoon. But for now, it is feeding time. You can see he's handling a rather large branch that he's torn away. The cambium layer, so that's the layer where nutrients are transported from the roots to the tops of the leaves um, in the trunks of the trees and then the branches you can see there they are these tearing away that outer layer that's quite tough and really good for rubbing up against if you're itchy but not really nice to eat so they want the, the sort of softer la layer you can see him just stripping it away quite easily there but it's fairly quiet. We've seen leopard tracks though this morning, but no luck in finding them just yet. And then the other thing that we heard a lot of last night was lions roaring. So pretty much from these elephants, we're going to shoot straight to the north and see if any lions crossed our boundary. And I think we will find some more elephants and maybe some baby elephants because I feel like we haven't watched the young calves play. We always seem to find ourselves with these gentle giants, the big Ellie bulls just sort of doing their thing so we'll try and change it up a little bit this morning but 
Sometimes it can be a bit of a challenge out on safari. But he's not going to really do much else other than eat. I mean, he weighs a fair few tons. He's got to eat lots of food every day. Randy, great question from you about the nutrients that they are uh, obtain from the branches. Um, so what's really important for an animal's diet, sort of in terms of like minerals and things like that, they need to have phosphorus, they need to have calcium, they need to get nitrogen and stuff like that into their system in the form of, of something in the plant. So each tree, each flower, each fruit, each grass species will all have, you know, different variations in what minerals and vitamins they have. And then also that will vary on how much calories they're you know taking in um from those vegetation types too so for that particular tree uh, i'm not exactly sure on the the mineral content or vitamins that they're getting just because i'm not a scientist and i or botanist sorry and i don't really study plants but i'm sure somewhere on the interweb they'll be able to, to give you an exact breakdown of of what they have this this one however is feeding on something completely different this elephant is feeding on a guari tree um the euclea genus of of trees which is quite a common type and it's not a very palatable plant in terms of what it tastes like so if you take one of those leaves and it's something that safari guides especially in this area or in in, in africa where these trees occur is they'll give the uh, leaf to their guests and say chomp on it and basically what it tastes like it tastes like if you're eating a sour grape you know when all the tannins are trapped in the skin of a grape it dries your mouth out that's exactly what that plant does now elephants are known or lots of animals are known to eat medicinal plants for various reasons so sometimes what you'll do is you'll see um, animals feeding on guari trees and because of the high tannins if you have a bit of an upset stomach so if you maybe have diarrhea eating a fair few amount of those leaves I don't know for humans it works um, it can help sort of just um, ease it up a little bit and well help you feel a little bit better so those tannins the tannins definitely do help you but not a very nice thing to eat all the time but at this time of the year you really cannot be picky you've got to put your taste buds behind you and kind of chew through the um, the not uh, sort of so preferred plants to eat. They're not going to eat anything poisonous though. They're you know they're not they're not that desperate. There you go. You can see this is another thing we get to see uh, is elephants testing their strength and how easy they're able to pick up and move branches around to find vegetation that's hiding underneath that. Normally it's nice green grass that hasn't been fed on, you know, protected and not burnt from the sun. But now at this time of the year you will you won't find a green blade of grass anywhere even with that little bit of rain we had a few days ago it wasn't quite enough i don't even know if we quite got a mill or even two mills of rain right i think we're going to leave these ellie bulls to continue with their feeding for the day we're going to head north to see if we can find some lions Welcome back to the river stick and the water still flows. Remember, this is a river that has got its highs and lows. It is at its high in the months of April, May and June. And when it's high, the banks do break and the water do spread quite far out. This year, it was witnessed to be one of the high, you know, highest, which is very, very good news. Unlike previous years, the river had gone really down because at the source, there was a huge enrichment. Uh, is that MJ? Where does the Mara River originate from? Yes, the Mara River originate from, uh, it originates from a place called Mao, uh, Mao Forest. It's, an, it's at, at an elevation of about 3,000. Um, and there, it's where it starts in a very big swamp and flows down it's got small tributaries here and there but that's the main source 
at the source, it was badly affected in the last 10 years, such that we saw the levels go down drastically and badly. Last year, early, it was seen at its, at its lowest, and there was alarm raised that it was going to dry. The government has intervened in many ways and introduced, you know, many trees, replanted more trees, and, you know, people living in these areas were relocated to pave way for the, you know, um, improvement of the water source. So not to worry anymore. Looks like the river is going to be flowing for the next many, many, many years. Remember, it is the main source of livelihood for many, many animals, plus human beings living just before it enters the reserve. It does cut through the reserve uh, into two parts. You know, passing through the reserve about um, uh, 60 to 80 kilometers across, forming the Greater Mara and the Mara Triangle. It's always mucky, as you can see, but that's the color and the animals still drink it. It's a um, permanent river, and that's why we have, we have crocodiles and Sassy Kathy, thank you. I hope you're well and good. You asked me um, how deep it is. It varies a lot from one area to the other. Like where you're looking over there, it is very shallow. As you can tell, there's lots of rapids and rocks. And in some places where I would say it deepest, it could be at the moment, it could be around six to seven feet um, at some areas that is the deepest. Uh, I might be wrong, some areas might be deeper, but um, over where we are, you know, to see a hippocross, to see um, a wildebeest disappear, that is uh, around uh, six, seven feet. That is, um, you know, the deepest. Some areas might be deeper, but it never gets deeper than that. But it differs from where you are. There is no actual, you know, constant depth throughout. So it differs from one place to the other. And also the, rain, the rainfall does change it every year. One place might be deep this year, and next year, uh, next year it might be shallow in the same area, and another year it might be even be deeper than the, the, the previous year. Okay, for more information about this river, I'll be here, and hopefully by the time you come back, we'll have something for you. Well, it's true, uh, Isaac, the weather patterns in East Africa have been quite erratic for the last five years, maybe the whole part of Africa. And these lions are quite a distance from the Mara River. And this is one member of what we call the Olololo Pride. It's one of the largest prides that we got in this area. Total, when they are all together, they could be between 15 and 18, that number keeps fluctuating depending on who sees them where and when. But from where we are, this is their territory. And no doubt she is not alone. And strange for them to, or rather strange for her to be lying down there. Cleo, how often does it rain in the Mara? You'd like to know. I'll tell you what, Cleo, this morning we had some pretty good showers for about half an hour, uh, from about 5.30 in the morning to about 6-ish. But more often than not, we get a rains in the afternoon. And Mara in general gets about 1,000 millimeters of rainfall annually. We've got two seasons of rains in the Mara. We've got the long rains that comes uh, in the months of March, April, May, sometimes through uh, June. And then you've got the short rains that will come in October, November, and sometimes around Christmas. Those are the two rain seasons we got here. But in general, about a thousand millimeters of rainfall annually. Every afternoon for the last, I would say, one week, we have had some very good showers. 
Well, once in a while, as is typical for lions or lionesses, they'll put their head up, look around, scan any lost prey that might want to come close to where they are, because the lions are very opportunist, opportunistic and they'll always chance on anything that comes their way. So in those thickets there, they could hide for the rest, for the better part of the day. These lions during the migration is their best time in terms of food availability. Now, what happens when the migration is gone, they have to change their menu, they have to change their eating skills, they have to change their hunting ways, and they're left with animals that do not migrate as much. I'm talking about, say, Cape buffaloes, elands, and uh, giraffes. You may notice they look a little bit different, uh, these cats, when these animals are gone, because it's not easy for them to hunt the big game that's sometimes dangerous, like buffaloes or giraffes or elands. Elands are quite fast. They take off very quickly. We have seen giraffes hitting, you know, or hurting the lions as they hunt them. And buffaloes the same. So you'll notice they look a little bit thin, not as much, but they look a little bit thin until the migration comes back. But currently, as it is now, it is party time for them throughout until the month of October, when the migration will be heading south again to Serengeti National Park. We have another pride not very far from where we are called the Owino Pride. And a few days ago, they brought down three wildebeest in one day. They ate two and then they left the other one for the hyena and the vultures. So this is all part of time. And what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to imagine that female, she is not alone. She must be having other members there, as I said. A friend of mine told me there could have been 10 in that particular area where she is lying. And I want to take a big loop, go around, and see how close I can go and see possibly whether I can be able to get the other nine members of this particular parade. And as I said, this is one of the largest uh, parades here. We're going to give you one more look of that female just before we move on. It's a bit chilly now, and that's why you see her tucked in there and folding herself. And of course, she's trying to keep her body warmth. Typical for all cats, nothing out of the ordinary. And you notice she blends in very well in that fallen tree there. Very good. Keep enjoying the snooze. Let me see whether I'll get the other members of your pride. Thanks, David. Welcome back, everybody. Well, we've been working hard on tracks of this Unkohoma Pride here in Juma, and uh, we were working with two of the other guides, um, and the tracks have led us to the lions, and they are currently doing something other than sleeping. So we're just moving up the road here to join in. There's a herd of buffalo and a pride of lions. So let's hope we can get some action. It can be pretty hard to watch sometimes, but we've been up and down, up and down. The tracks of these lions have been chasing buffalo for hours. Uh, it sometimes makes it a bit difficult to actually follow um, when they're moving like that, turning, turning, turning. So one of my friends has managed to find them up here. I'm just trying to see where exactly. Keep your eyes peeled, Theo. Buffalo herd has been up and down this road. The Nkoma Pride are excellent buffalo hunters. We saw them yesterday. We spent the morning with them yesterday sleeping and now this is exactly what I want to find. <laughs> Ferrari Safari, I'm just edging along here everybody. Uh, I'm waiting for Mike to hear my vehicle and to tell me where to come in. Okay. Okay. Other people are busy chatting, so that might take a minute. Okay, 
buffalo dung in the road. <laughs> okay, so still, still got that track. Okay. In we go. Hold on, everybody. This could be. The thing is with buffalo and lion, the lion make themselves obvious to the buffalo and then they try and selectively pick off an individual that is, uh, is weak, is lazy, is injured, is young, is old even. That is what lions do. So I can't see any of them. I can just see our vehicles. Okay, here are some lions. Here are the cubs being very well behaved. Oh, here's the whole pride, actually. The cubs in a little cuddle puddle. There we go. Okay, so the buffalo are nearby, apparently. I don't know where. But um, I was on the tracks of, <coughs> excuse me, of at least three lionesses, two lionesses and a male before that had chased buffalo through the drainage system. So when hunting like this happens, the pride splits up. One, two, three, four here. So that makes sense. The cubs will hang together, waiting for the food to be provided. All nine of them together. All nine cubs together on the right there. And wonderful lighting. So, Sorry it doesn't seem to be as active as we thought it was. But they have been chasing buffalo, no doubt, since around 10 o'clock. I went around the dam where the dam cam reported lions at about half past nine. And I found where the lions had been around the dam and where there'd been some buffalo. And so since then, they've probably been this cat and mouse sort of chase with the buffalo. And buffalo can be formidable. Be absolutely formidable in their own right and the only time that lions can actively hunt them is if they get separated if the herd stays together and the herd stays as a cohesive unit it's almost impossible to hunt them and if buffalo knew that they would probably behave quite differently But yet what happens is individuals get isolated and that is how the lions take advantage. Hello, the stick. Well, the cubs on the right there are all still young. One year, just over one year for some of them. So, you know, that you can start seeing the beginnings of a man from about a year and a half or so. Uh, from two years it becomes very obvious who the males are and then from three uh, their mane starts to really fill out and by the time they're four, four and a half, five, most males have got a very full developed mane. Obviously there is a genetic sort of variable there and some people also will go so far as to say there's an enormous amount of testosterone required to help boost the mane and once it has They've gone through a whole lot of fighting and aggression. Apparently that actually stimulates main development. Look at this. A pied kingfisher hunting down here by twin dams. This is my favorite kingfisher. They're incredible. They hover above the water and they have specially adapted eyes to compensate for the change in angle, the way that, wa that water bends light. So, you know, when you're in a pool and you want to touch your toes and suddenly your toes are not where you thought they were. This pied kingfisher. Oh, there it goes. Oh, amazing. The pied kingfisher actually has special adaptations in their eyes and their lens. Did manage to get something small there. What did you get? 
I did see frogs last night outside my room, so I wonder if little frogs have been around. Little tadpoles, maybe? If it was, it was small. So they can pinpoint exactly where the prey is in the water, something that obviously we can't do. And they compensate for that change, that refraction of the light. And they go straight in. And look how large that, that bull is, that beak. It's quite long. Just perfect for stabbing in to, into the water. Amazing. So this one looks like a male. It's got a double band on its breast. And I'm going to sit here and watch it for a little while longer. Welcome back to Unbound Pinda, everybody, where we driving around, searching high and low, have found these two lionesses. Looks like they've been walking for quite a while with that it's coming out of their breath as they go along. But this is quite exciting because it is still quite cool. There are two of them, the others just out of picture pass behind us. And we could potentially see something exciting this morning. One of these moms or one of these lionesses, should I say rather, could be the mothers of those three youngsters that we saw yesterday, which is quite a distance away, but we are gonna stick with them for now. We haven't seen much game coming up to where, where we've come from behind us, but you never know, they might flash something out of the grass as they go along. Everyone just commenting on how many lions they've seen all over the show today. Spoiled for choice with lions, that's for sure. We are always excited to see them, especially when they're on the move. That's him, that's him, that's him, that's him. And we're not going to go closer, okay? Plus, we've got an African wildcat. We have an African... Wow, good morning everyone, it's an amazing day out here. It is fantastic, this is awesome. We've got an African wildcat actually lying at burrows waiting to hunt. The temptation is to go closer. Sorry, this is like a crazy introduction, but anyway, the temptation is to go closer, but I'm not going, you see how he keeps looking at us? I'm not even gonna start the engine. We're just gonna sit and wait because we may even see him try and make a kill here this morning. So we are gonna just sit tight, we're not going anywhere. I am over the moon. Oh my goodness, this couldn't be a better morning. Couldn't be a better morning. It could be, maybe. You see how he keeps looking over his shoulder? <laughs> okay guys, I have to come clean. I, I'm just, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> It's not my birthday. <laughs> I would never tell anyone when my birthday is, I promise you. It's not my birthday. I appreciate the good wishes, but keep them coming anyway. <laughs> Guys, we have an African wildcat. This is unbelievable. And you, you see how it's focused? There's little burrows just in front of it. This cat is actively hunting. I know when I say active, I don't mean it's moving, but it's actually sitting there watching a burrow. It's totally focused. Totally, folks, and we are not going to budge either until that cat does something. Oh, man, I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm really sorry, man. I just couldn't resist. I just couldn't resist. So, but anyway, let me, let me tell you something. While we're going to focus on the wildcat there, but someone out there knew for a fact it wasn't my birthday today. And they, I think they had an effigy of me because I managed to spill half a mug of coffee all over my crotch on the way to work this morning. Yeah, it was warm, that's all I can say. So whoever that was, thanks for that. But this is, this is incredible. If we, can, if we can just have the patience to sit this out, even if we go across to the other feeds because I know our colleagues are having incredible NJ says I'm a rascal. Uh, sometimes. But I know our colleagues are having an incredible sighting, so 
I'm very happy we just swap between between the sightings. There's no problem. But like I say, we'll just stick it out here. If there's any super good action on the site, we'll be sure to let Kirsty in, in FC know. Um, so yeah, I'm just I'm blown away that we got this this morning. Oh, and not only that, um, um, Mech, uh, Mech had a bit traitor, uh, Veronique. <coughs> she found a caracal this morning as well. Can you, we actually went to go look for it. We couldn't find it. It moved off into the block. So whatever's happening, there's some good cat activity this morning. Huh? But the beautiful thing with watching this cat is that complete focus. This cat is very, very much aware that we are here. Every now and again, it would look over its shoulder. Um, but the, the important thing, you know, for, it's tempting to say, okay, well, let's go get a closer look. And you drive down the road, we can get another 200 meters closer. But then we just disturb the sighting, and that's not the objective. You know, the objective is to observe these animals doing what they would be doing even if we weren't here. And that, is, I think, is the absolute key thing with us. And, you know, if David can zoom out a fraction there, you'll just see how exposed this environment is, how exposed it is. You see that? So that cat would be on absolute tenter hooks at the moment as well. So he wouldn't want to compromise himself. Thanks, David. That's brilliant. Thank you. So he wouldn't want to risk any kind of thing for himself. You know, he is lying in a very exposed position. So I think if we moved closer, he would just bolt. And that's not what I want. We, I mean, we saw them, or a cat, dragging that me that meerkat off the other day. It may be the same wild cat. I don't know. It's not straight line distance from here to there. It's probably a kilometer. Yeah, and they, they've got fairly large, large territories. These cats. But it, I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd be absolutely guessing if I said it was the same one. I've got nothing to base that on. So, but wow, what a morning! And if any of you are out there, you're lying in bed, you're sitting on the couch having coffee, you are walking the dogs, looking at it on your phone, whatever. It's just amazing having you with us. It is always, I really, really appreciate the fact that you all take the time to watch us and participate, ask questions. It is, it's just brilliant. Just good. Shelly has asked, how large is this cat? Um, from here, it just looks like a tom. In other words, a male, it just it looks quite bulky. Um, imagine a large house cat, like a, a nice big chunky house cat. That's kind of the size range that you're looking at here. They've got slightly longer legs than a, than a house cat. One of the big problems with these is that they can hybridize very, very, very easily with domestic cats, uh, what we call feral cats. In other words, you may have um, feral cat populations in, in you know, bordering on, on natural areas, on reserves, and you get these feral cats just, you know, you can't keep a cat in. They filter through fences and over fences, and and then they hybridize with these guys. So we, I think we're very lucky out here that we've got a, I'd imagine, or I hope, a fairly, or a completely pure population. But it is a fun research project that I'd actually like to get started in the not too distant future, is actually looking more closely at our African wildcat population and kind of get an idea of densities, um, you know, looking at the genetic makeup of these animals, that kind of stuff, because they are super, super, super cool cats. They're cool cats. Magical Mr. Mistopheles. Welcome back, everybody, to Adbeon Pinda, where these two lionesses have stopped I think, to catch their breath. Quite a, a hill that they climbed before that to get to here, and they're just sussing out the scenes over to the left-hand side. Like I said, we didn't see much coming up here in terms of game for them. One or two watering holes that aren't too far from here that might be a good option to, to go to. But you can see she's found quite a nice perch to to stop and, and scan and just listen to to her surrounds and see if there isn't anything of interest maybe a couple of zebra make a bit of a noise in the background if they have a bit of a fight her sister or other lioness has laid flat in the long grass behind her so we can't can't see her at the moment 
but you can see just how vigilant she is. She's looking big old yawn. Let's see if she doesn't do that again. And that shock of oxy oxygen to the brain may be starting to wake up a bit more. She might get up and carry on moving. Which like I was saying earlier, Linda commenting on how gorgeous this particular line is. is she is, she's, looks like she's in her prime, Linda. Beautiful markings on her face. I love that white underneath her, her chin. Those black marks behind her ear. Another big old yawn. I think she's thanking you, Linda, for the compliments. But I think now with that, typical signs of them starting to get a little bit more active, maybe a little bit of grooming. She might get up and, and carry on. I just had a scan with the binoculars just now. Quite a distance away with a couple of zebra and wildebeest. Quite close to a watering hole, a couple of giraffe as well, but they are really far away. Looks like something's caught her attention behind us now. But in this long grass, things that we might not be able to see are things like warthog. Uh, who are just yeah, too short for, for us to see that she could find in this area if she gets up and carries on walking. Another big old yawn. Very impressive set of teeth there as she opens her, her mouth. I'm not sure if you caught a glimpse of that tongue as she did that. Very, very rough tongue, that sandpapery tongue. You see what she's doing now, grooming herself. Often what they do if they've had a, had a meal when they're covered in blood. And when they groom each other, they're able to lick things like ticks off each other. <laughs> but let's see now, if after all that I've said, if she doesn't get up and, and move. It is everyone just saying how her yawning is making everyone else yawn back at home. It is contagious sometimes, especially when she does it as often as she has <laughs> this morning. Struggling to, to wake up, maybe. It has been a very crisp morning out here on and beyond Pinda. But quite a bit of grooming going on all of a sudden. And I have a feeling she's going to move. Janet, you're asking if we know her age. She, there's, so in this particular pride of lions, there's a mom with three uh, sort of sub-adult males that we were with yesterday. There's a mom with two very small youngsters who are about three, four months old. I don't think she's the mom of them. And if I'm not mistaken, she hasn't had her first litter of, of youngsters yet. So I would say she's about between three and four years old. I think that's how old she is. But it would be interesting to see now if that other lioness comes to join her. Maybe she's the one uh, or she's the mum of the, the, the young males that we were with yesterday. Which would mean she's obviously a little bit older because those cubs are now... Well, those youngsters are around a year, a year and a half, which would put her at about five, six, six years old. It is still quite nice and cool. Uh, and this is if they haven't had a successful evening hunting-wise, will often make the most of a cooler morning. So I'm going to stick around and see what happens here. We've actually just had a jackal trot past the cat behind it. We're not moving the camera around. I can't afford to do that. If we take our eyes off that cat and something happens, it's going to happen at breakneck speed. So I can't, I really don't want to like pan around or anything. We're just going to stick just like that because you say he's watching us now. He's so alert. He's so alert. I was just saying to David and Moritz, Moritz is with us this morning, by the way, everyone. And um, I was just saying to him that this cat will lie here for hours on end. You could sit here for three, four, five hours and that cat will not budge. If he thinks he's got a chance of catching someone down a hole like that, he'll sit and wait. 
and he, he, he's fast. I mean, those of you who have, have cats at home can understand that. And, you know, <coughs> so Chris has asked a very, very interesting question there. Is this the ancestor of domestic cats? Uh, there's a lot of evidence for that. It's been strongly debated um, over the years, but the, it's generally acknowledged that domestic cats stem from this, or actually European wild cats. And then the question is, well, are European wild cats and these the same species or not? Because they can hybridize as well. You know, if you put them together, they can. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of debates on that. But the, the, like I said, the problem there is um, with the hybridizing, yeah, we're losing. And it, it, you can argue, well, so what if they hybridize and you've got a whole population of mixed cats running around in reserves? Are they, are they not just fulfilling the exact same role as purebred African wildcats would. And obviously, your densities would be controlled because it's not like you've, in a reserve like this where you've got your whole suite of natural predators on on cats, even if they did hybridize, it's not like they're going to get to some crazy density and eat you out of house and home like happens on some sub-oceanic islands, these kind of things. In this but if they hybridize, you've got them on a, on, a, on a reserve. Okay, well, what is the implication for that for conservation? Um, yeah, so to answer your question, they are the progenitors of, of domestic cats. That's kind of like one of the widely accepted theories there. But there's still a lot of work to be done on it. And that is exactly why I want to initiate a research uh, project on these cats on Swalu. Because I want to find out. Because remember, we had a Swalu is comprised of, I don't know, 50 different farms or what were historically farms in these areas. And many of these farms would have had um, domestic cats on them. So what is the extent, if any, if any, I'm not saying there is, of any kind of hybridization? And what does that mean for the population? What is the genetic robustness of these, of these hybrids, if they are hybrids? Ah, it's so interesting and so complex. And those are like the big kind of questions. Like uh, we've... James has asked, do female African wild, wild cats pick up males when it's time to mate? Absolutely. They, they exhibit the same traits, the same behavior that we all know in domestic cats. And there's a lot of noise, a lot of screeching going on. But yeah, that's exactly the same pattern there. But how cute is this? Just think what we're watching here. How often do we ever get to see an African wild cat hunting in the open? And like I said earlier, when I say it's actively hunting, I really mean that. You know, it doesn't mean that it's walking around and stalking like a lion is, but what this cat is doing is precisely the same as a lion or a cheetah stalking its prey. This cat has stalked up to a bow and now it's just waiting for, I don't know what's in it. Maybe it's a mongoose, maybe it's a meerkat, maybe it's a squirrel, who knows, but it's waiting for whatever's in that burrow to pop out. It could even be something like anteating chats. You know, these little anteating chats that nest underground in burrows, perhaps one flitted down a burrow there, um, you know, to get away from it or to go into a nest, and now this cat's waiting. So we are seeing active hunting behavior of an African wild catcher. This is really, really, really good stuff. Eh? And I know, just bear with us. It's just sitting still, but there's, there's a lot going on here at, at, at one time. Yeah, good, sitting still there. I got a zebra which is not still. It is on the move after having a drink. And there's another younger one there that still has to quench. It is thirst. Did you get enough? They always have to drink very quickly. They cannot trust anybody. They do not know what could be happening when they're drinking because we have seen some predators laying ambush to them when they're having a drink. These are the common zebra, sometimes you also call them the plains zebra or the bachelors zebra. Always going in big herds, sometimes smaller herds of one male, three females and some youngsters with them. But this time around, because of the migration, we are seeing them in the hundreds, together with of course thousands of the wildebeests. Not a single wildebeest here because, of course, they are two different species. 
Let's try and move differently. More of them there. So mornings being cool, quite active, time to drink, time to eat, time to move. And you can see how the grass is being blown a little bit by some nice breeze with all the iconic trees of the Mara called the Balanites or the shepherd trees. And the blue escarpment you see in the background there is called the Olo Lolo escarpment. Always great sightings to see any animals in these plains. Now imagine leaf, like the lioness we were seeing before, we can see it now. But now if you like to know whether zebras prefer short grass or long grass, they change depending on the season on or what is available. But just look at them carefully. They don't care much about the long grass. Unlike the wildebeest that you'll see eating short grass or small antelopes, zebras have no issues eating long grass. But normally they prefer green short grass. Got a new friend coming in there, not related to these animals, but how nice to see these amphibious. It's a hippopotamus. Looks a little bit nervous. Yeah, because it's not the right time for her to be out. And again, as I say, because it's a bit cool, that's why she's out. If it's pretty warm, she'd be back in the water. So where those zebras were drinking, that's where she was. Not sure she wants to change her habitat. And if you look at her carefully, you got some two, three little birds on her back. And those birds, we call them ox pickers. We've got two types of ox pickers in Africa, a red bill or yellow bill ox pickers, and she's definitely shy and she knows she should be in the water. Hippos also face a few challenges from predators like hyenas or lions, and they know the best place for them to be safe is in the water, and I want to believe that's where she has headed to. Beautiful zebras, I will let them enjoy the day and go look for some other interesting stuff. Well, thank you, David. Good luck in the Mara this side this morning. It is a wonderful place to be. And well, everybody, we are with very sleepy lions again. <laughs> the buffalo, I can hear them. They're just up the road here. They're not far. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, the lions are sort of weighing up their options now between hunger and effort. Uh, nothing to say that they won't continue, but we don't know how many times they tried. And um, buffalo and lion have been at this game for a very long time, everybody. The primary predator of the buffalo is the lion. So just because we see a herd of buffalo doesn't mean it's a sure thing for lions. If a lone buffalo bull is isolated, obviously we find lone buffalo bulls quite often. Those guys are in big trouble against lions, especially experienced buffalo hunters. But a cohesive unit of buffalo that know what they're doing and the males come forward in unison to fight the lions or to fend them off. Lions cannot go against an animal that charges them. The sort of the way of a predator is to chase things that run. If something doesn't run, they don't know what to do with themselves. Uh, they do not know what to do with themselves. That's all predators. Their instinct kicks in when an animal runs away. But if the animals turn and charge them with horns glistening in the sunshine, well, it's a formidable defense that they have. So sometimes lions will pick another day. Buffalo hunting is a very dangerous affair. Many a lion has been killed in the past due to hunting buffalo. But the need to eat sometimes outweighs that fear. And sometimes that fear outweighs the need to eat, all depending on the effort required. But it's 
not um, guaranteed that they didn't eat something last night. There's lots of grooming that's been going on, so they might have eaten something small. On our tracking to this position, we did find lots of tracks of zebra that had been chased by the lions. They don't look as dirty as they did yesterday morning. But who knows, we're going to stay right here. Maybe they'll decide to get up and go chase the herd. So I've just been scrounging through the hunting records <coughs> of African wildcats, and it is pretty remarkable what they're actually going for. We know their, their primary diet are, are rodents, what we call murids, that's little rats and mice, um, including um, ratus ratus, you know, these big um, domestic rats and things. <laughs> Maybe not domestic, but certainly feral rats. And um, so they, that's their primary diet. But yes, they go for a huge range of prey items. Those of you who may recall, we've seen corons here. It's a bird, maybe twice the size of a large chicken. They'll catch those. Uh, spring airs, scrub airs, red rock rabbits, grasshoppers, crickets, obviously a whole range of other bird species. Um, they've even been recorded taking um, lambs of small antelope, things like Stianbuck and Kreisbok. So they're not averse to doing those kind of, you know, catching those kind of prey items. So and we've seen as well things like meerkats. We've had first-hand experience of that. Um, Cape ground squirrels. You know, we know they take those kind of things. So their diet is actually pretty varied. But rodents are their, are their key thing. And the beautiful thing in the Kalahari, these systems are very, very much rainfall driven and you get what you call boom and bust explosion. So if you have good rains and well-timed rains, you can get these massive rodent explo explosions or moths or armored ground crickets or whatever. You get these crazy fluctuations in different species. And of course, that will just play right into the, I was, was going to say hands of a wildcat, but it will play right into the claws of an African wildcat if you, if you get a rodent outbreak out there. And even the diversity of rodents that they catch, okay, I'm, I'm going to say elephant shrew is not a rodent, so I'm just putting it out there. But, um, okay, I've got a quiz for you, everyone. Okay, how much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? But remember, it depends if it's hardwood or softwood. And I want the answer in square feet, please. So how much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood on softwood and hardwood? Or I could ask you some tough ecological questions that would spark some interesting debates. Well, I could ask you about the geology. That would also spark a debate, if you want. Or I can ask you about the gestation of an... <laughs> well, let's steer clear of geology, I think. Okay, what is the gestation of an African wildcat? There's the question. I'll make it easy for everyone today. I'll plunge... I'll plunge into the tough stuff tomorrow. Favors asked, are these the smallest wildcats in Africa? Definitely not. Um, in fact, the smallest one we have here is called a black-footed cat, black-footed cat. These are minuscule, minuscule little animals. Um, it is about probably a quarter the size of this. And they actually occur on Swalia as well. They like these areas very, very typically though. Their favorite habitat are um, the Karoo area, so these more central parts of South Africa, where you get these tiny, tiny little scrubby bushes. 
And, and those are absolutely remarkable cats to follow around. If you ever have an opportunity of seeing a, a small, sp uh, a black-footed cat, some people do call them small spotted cats, but the problem is you get a whole range of different kinds of small spotted cats, like extending right through Africa up into Asia and, that's, and even South America. So we tend to tend to not use the name small spotted cat for that. So if you want to see it, have a look up, look up um, black footed cat, black footed cat. In Afrikaans, it's a, they've got a beautiful name for it. It's called a mees, a mees whoop teer. A mees whoop is an anthill and a teer is a tiger or a leopard, depending, you know, there's various reasons for the origin of that name, but a meat swap teed, which means this tiger or leopard that lives inside antils. And these little black-footed cats are known to be super, super, super aggressive, and they will often actually sleep over inside these termite mounds that have been broken open by things like artfark and that. And you, some of the classic photographs of them are, you know, like this like angry little cat sitting inside a termite mound. Um, but yeah, so that's the smallest cat that we got out here. These cats, by contrast, they're actually quite big and chunky. <coughs> and has anyone got the gestation of these yet? We just moved on a little bit after we saw all the zebras and the hippopotamus outside the water and we have come to some water point. Uh, this is kind of a spring and it empties here and this area will always have water all around the air. And we got some Egyptian geese in there and if you look carefully, there are some goslings. The goslings are chicks of these geese. And as much as we call them geese, they are ducks. And I've been following them for quite some time. And I think we still got eight. This is the number that hatched from the word go or from when I started to see them. And being that young, before they get to about five, six weeks, they may not be able to graze or eat what the parents would eat. So they'll always bring them in the water, do a bit of swimming and eat any soft plants, planktons in the water. That's what they're basically being fed on before they are like six, seven weeks and they're able to graze and eat food for adults. If you look carefully there, the two adults, and that is a male and a female. Very territorial ducks, and they will deal with any predator coming for their goslings by engaging them in very big fights on the ground and also in the air. Now, while still there, I've seen some other species of bird, and we're trying to locate it. Got pretty small, small chicks, and they are also feeding on the planktons like the goslings. But this belongs to a different species because they are from a lapwing. There, you're gonna see a small chick. Top Mark, you're asking whether this is a natural water hole. Yes, this is a natural water hole, and most of the water points that we have in the Mara, all of them are natural. So it's a natural water hole because, as I said earlier, it comes from a spring. And then it empties here, and this water either it goes underground, and the times when the levels are high, and the times the levels are low. And during the rainy season, the levels are quite high. If you look carefully, there are the two chicks, that's one of them. And this is definitely different from the goslings we just watched. And it is a member of the spar winged, uh, spar winged lapwing. And cast in the final control says she loves to see uh, this chick here. The mother definitely is not very far from here. And lapwings are also like the geese associated with water. Now, at this age, in general, is anything in the water they can catch for themselves? In a small insect floating there? Worms? Any crustaceans? Any invertebrates? That's what basically she is feeding on. 
Now, the mother has two chicks, and I've noticed one of them is always more aggressive than the other. You can see the other one behind there? And I'm sure the mother is definitely somewhere watching. She cannot stay far away from these chicks because she knows what they're exposed to. Well, I would imagine like the Marshall Eagle we saw earlier would not bother to come and get such small little prey, but we got monitor lizards which could quickly come and catch them. Other smaller eagles like the Tony Eagle wouldn't mind coming to catch uh, these chicks here for breakfast. Not that I would want that to happen, but any insect they see floating in the water, that's what they quickly catch. Look at their legs, they're quite long, and that helps them when they get in the water, they do not sink. The feet are widespread to give them a good base as they walk in the water. And in general, you'll always see them in fresh water points. You can see all the insect, if you look carefully on the screen, you can see small insects just running up and down there. And I'm sure there are all sorts of, uh, I would say, animals, if you call them animals too, that could be floating there. And that's, that's exactly what they're catching very quickly, choop, and swallow. Oops, that was not right, did not go very well. Every time I've come here when I'm passing on this road, I get excited to see them. And knowing that I'll come here maybe in the afternoon or another day, I will leave them to enjoy their hunting. Yes, I'm so pleased that David got those lapwing chicks. They are just the absolute cutest, cutest, cutest things. Except for shell duck chicks. They're cute. Cuter. So what's the answer on the question? Have we got any answers yet? We'll 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 do the we'll do the gestation of a of a wildcat first. Tegan says twelve weeks. Uh, not quite. It's a little, it's almost, but a little bit shorter than that. Good call, good call. Steve says 56 to 68. I'm assuming you're meaning days and not weeks. Is that correct? Days? Yeah, that'll be, that'll be days. That is almost spot on at just a couple of days shy of 68 so it's 56 to 63 very 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 good call and w something i just want to put it well you know what i'm not a big believer in telling people gestations of animals or how many spots of things are because those are things you can go look up it's super easy stuff i'm more like into like the ecological side of things the, those kind of questions but what is interesting on that is when you look at your predators okay most predators have a very short gestation period relative or compared to herbivores. The reason for that, imagine this, okay, I, I'm just saying, I think this cat is a male, okay, I think it's, I'm just going on size, you know, I, I don't know why I say it, but I think so. But let's say this was a female, okay, and let's say she was pregnant. She, she had kittens and or was going to have kittens, and but she now was going to carry these things for six months or seven or eight months or nine months or 14 months like a giraffe imagine how progressively more and more and more difficult it would be to hunt the more heavily pregnant she was and not only that it's one thing you're saying okay it's difficult to hunt now but i can still do it think of the risk to the female as well as to her potential progeny by being so heavy and then having to go out and hunt and that. Um, so be, as a hunter, you normally have these gestation periods that are a lot shorter. That, that other, one of, the, one of the answers there was three months. That's very typical for like a lot of your big cats, you know, leopard, lion, that kind of stuff. But um, in terms of these, these are a little bit shorter. You're smaller, your your mammal, roughly. Uh, uh, these are just gross generalizations of people, please. Um, the shorter the gestation period. Um, but in terms of predators, they can't afford to have these hugely long gestation periods and um, when they actually have to actively hunt for their food. A herbivore, on the other hand, hey, well, that tree's not going to run away. 
yeah, sure, it might put out some chemicals, might have some thorns, you know, it might take a little bit of effort getting the leaves that you need. Um, but you can keep moving. Your, your prey is not really running away from you. Um, so that's why they can actually afford to have these longer gestation periods. And also your risk of predation, if you're a herbivore, because there's a lot of you. It's not like you're going to be spending your whole your pregnancy period running away from from an African wildcat or a lion or a cheetah. You know, the, the odds of you not being eaten are stacked in your favor. Whereas for an African wildcat that's heavily pregnant, well, she has no odds. She has to hunt. So she doesn't have a choice. She either hunts or she dies. Um, so yeah, their gestation periods tend to be a lot shorter than herbivores. And then no answers on how much wood would a woodchuck chuck. I can't believe it. Yeah. Don't. <laughs> Pretty Canadian says, <laughs> wood, woodchucks can't chuck wood because they've got poor upper body strength. Yeah, I love those kind of answers. Eh? Yep, that's just, yeah, that's brilliant. Well done. Good one. Good one. I hope you've all got the patience to sit here because even if we go across to the other feeds and that, because I know our colleagues are having fantastic sightings, I'm well aware of that. But yeah, you can keep coming back to us because, you know, David, Moritz, and myself, we are not going, we are going to sit here until this cat either moves off of his own free will or it'll always be his own free will. It's not like, oh, please don't go anywhere, cat. No, you know, he'll move off when he wants to, or he catches something, or he tries and he misses. But either way, we're still going to sit here. Thanks, Dylan. Well, we're going to do the same. We're here in uh, Juma once again, and we're going to sit here with the Unkuhumas until they catch something. Why not? <laughs> little. The only one that's up and grooming is this little one. Now, we spent the whole day with him yesterday. That's okay. I quite like spending time with lions, especially when they're little ones. But it is going to be warm today. So, soon. We're going to see them all moving again into the shade. Lions are, for the most part, active by night. But they can and will hunt in the daytime if the opportunity presents itself. So, for example, if that buffalo herd makes themselves very noticeable or very obvious, or an animal walks past, they will jump up in moments. But they've obviously decided we've been chasing the buffalo all night. We didn't catch one. Let's just take a little breather, you know. And that breather turns into a bit of a nap. and turns into a full day of slumber. So I think we discussed it yesterday and a little bit this morning that although lions are very active hunters, the predator-prey interaction has evolved in such a way that predators aren't successful all the time. If anything, 20% of the time, lions, leopards, maybe a little bit more for some area-specific, prey-specific. Even a pride of this many lions still struggles to catch prey. So it's not just a feeding frenzy all the time. They're not just killing all the time. Let's quickly go to Dylan. Okay, this cat actually dived into this hole. He dived into that hole to try catch something. He dived straight into that hole to try catch something. It doesn't look like he was successful, but he jumped straight into that hole after something. But the way he's sitting there now, it looks like he's like, oh, shoot, I missed, missed that one. But anyway, let's just see and see what he does. But he's now sitting on top of that burrow that he had a quick dive into. I mean, these things happen so, so, so fast. I mean, to, to actually see it, you've you got to be live the entire time. You, know, you, got, you would have to sit for three hours live watching this cat to get that, that single moment over there. So just forgive us. I mean, that was, that was uh, completely unintentional. But 
Now he's like looking at us like it's our fault. Cat, relax. That's like typical cat, eh? It's like if he misses a kill, then he's gonna like look at someone else like it had, he had nothing to do with it. <clears throat> MJ has just asked, would he run away with a kill? MJ, depends what size prey it is. If it, let's say he caught a small mouse, a little murid, he grabs it over there, there's a very, very strong likelihood he would just gobble it up right where he's sitting. If it's something larger, like a ground squirrel or a meerkat, he would almost always take it into cover. Um, we saw that the other day when they caught that one meerkat, and the reason for that is once they've got a prey item, a larger prey item like that, this environment that he's sitting out is so exposed. We know there's jackals around, we know there's a caracal around, leopards move through you on a regular basis. Um, also there's eagles out, there's big, there's things like martial eagles that would happily gobble up a wildcat and it's prey for it half a chance. Um, so this cat would, if it had caught a large prey item, would move straight away into cover. They actually are known to stash kills in trees as well, occasionally, not common, but they do it as well. Um, Caracal do it as well. Of course, we know the well-known example of leopard doing that. But small prey items, they would they would eat on the spot, and that goes for insects, small small rodents, things like that. Yes, they are just gorgeous animals, absolutely stunning stuff. And it's not a species that you see often. You know, they they they've got a huge distribution. They are, and they are actually on the ground. They are common animals, but to actually see them and to see one like this sitting out in the open is just an absolute privilege. This is a real, real, real gem for me. <clears throat> Linma, you have got good eyes. The comment there was, you can see something small running on the far side, and you're quite correct, that is a lapwing. Same, uh, I can't remember which species David was watching on one of the other feeds with the chicks. Crowned lapwings. Oh, anyway, these are crowned lapwings as well, so it's probably the same species I think that he had there. That there's every now and again, there's... Uh, oh, okay, there we go. So it's a different species. Oh, this is a crowned lapwing. Every now and again, you'll get like a little glimpse of a, like a little dot moving behind the cat over there. This cat won't go for him. Those birds will be so, so alert and so on to this cat by now. And also this cat's focus is completely on something different. I'm really interested to see what's down that burrow. Because this cat is still, although he had like one attempt at it, I think that might be a very small burrow. And that cat knows for sure that thing is still down there. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess so that that burrow is also, there's not multiple entrances. And there's, in other words, there's multiple entrances. In other words, there's not also multiple exits. And I reckon that cat knows that whatever he's got is pinned down a single burrow over there. And that's why it's going to wait. And this is why it's so cool just for us to sit and wait. David, can you put that beer down, please? We can't drink beer so beer so early in the morning. All right. Sorry, I was just chatting to David there. This is this is fantastic, man. Wow, Gail has just asked, this is a good one, this is a goodie. And the question is, would African wildcats feed on armored ground crickets? You know, those crazy looking creatures that we've had a couple of weeks ago when John and was still there. Um, I, I think, and I've never seen them doing it, but I would I would guess that they would. If, if they were battling and they were not able to get other suitable prey items, which is unlikely. I mean, remember, these cats are just incredibly adaptable. Those of you who have house cats at home will know they just eat anything that they can get hold of, you know, from lizards to geckos to birds to, to rats to whatever they can get, they'll, the house cat will go for it. These cats are exactly the same. And out here, although we're not driving and seeing just things running around and bouncing around all over the place, this is actually a smorgasbord for an African wildcat. You know, the diversity is pretty wide for what they can catch so i would imagine a something like an armored ground cricket would be quite far down the list of a ideal prey item for them 
I mean, I wouldn't run around eating armored ground crickets either. Um, but that being said, if you had an African wildcat that was compromised in any way, maybe it's got an injury or it's just battling, mm, yes, I, I, I think they would go for one. But I've never seen it, so, and I don't think those things taste very good either. I'm just so excited about the sighting now. I mean, I'm just like, uh, you know, it, it's probably like the last thing that was on my mind coming out this morning. It was like, and it just shows, though, you can always, always expect something different in the outdoors. And uh, interestingly, in terms of when we were chatting about their gestation and their breeding and that, so they'll have litters anything from one to five again, kind of like domestic cats as well. Jay Mallory has asked, what would hunt an African wildcat? The answer there is lots of things. If you're this size, even though you're a predator, when you this size in this environment means you are very likely to fall prey to a whole range of things. Um, number one, and it's not in terms of predation, but it's intraspecific fighting. They can pick up very severe injuries in fighting with other wildcats, and that could lead to mortalities. Um, you can get disease. That's a, that's a very real threat. Um, and then in terms of actual predation, African rock pythons, which we get out here, they're not common, also called Natal pythons. Um, they're not common, but they will catch African wildcats. Eagles will catch African wildcats. One of the big predators on them that we've, we've seen out here are um, giant eagle owls. So our colleagues have been seeing them down in some of their places as well. We've had a couple of beautiful sightings here as well. These owls are massive birds and they will catch an African wildcat, you know, pretty, pretty easily. Um, and then your larger raptors, your other, your, your diurnal raptors, things like Marshall eagles, um, you know, they will, they will happily schnaffle a wildcat if they, if they get half a chance. And then things like leopards. Leopards are well known for taking um, other predators, things like jackals, you know, canids and that, and they will, they will grab a wildcat if they, if they had half a chance. And then you get other mortalities, which, <clears throat> in fact, there was some work done on, on leopards many, many years ago, done in the low felt on the incidence of leopard mortalities relating to, related to snake bite. And the, those figures are actually quite high. I can't remember exactly what the stats are offhand, but leopard mortalities due to snake bite is quite high. And I would be very surprised if it was any different with these little guys. You know, a cat is inquisitive, and also just their nature. They they'll go sleep under bushes in the heat of the day. They'll go down art park burrows to escape the heat. And as we've seen, remember in the, in the first couple of weeks, like three months ago when I started up with this, um, that was, w w there was a couple of those puff adders that we were following around. And we were saying, showing how cryptically camouflaged they were in hiding under the bushes in the heat of the day. Now a little cat like this goes in there to lie down in the shade and there's a puffy in there. You know, you can imagine there may be some kind of conflict of interest there. And you know, a bite on a snake on a, on a cat like this could well be lethal. So, yeah, they, they are prone to any, any number of ways of going to cat heaven, I guess. Or wherever cats go. But what are, I'm just blown away by the sighting this morning. And I know, yes, for some of, some of you might, some of you might sit there and say, well, it's just like this little blob on the landscape. But that little blob is a remarkably special blob. Uh, very well, Dylan, to spot an African wildcat. In general, they're very slow when they hunt, and of course, they do not want to burn so much kilocalories without catching their prey. We're lucky to get another pride of lions here, and if you look carefully, we can only see the back of it in this very tall elephant grass. And this particular pride is called the Mogoro pride. So that's one girl and she got a sister at one point. We saw them last night and not very far from where we saw them. And my guess is 
what would happen, they step very close to the river and they know they can chance uh, there will be scamming to cross and if that happens, they can easily catch one. There used to be three sisters way back and there are so many lion dynamics that happen either from other predators or hyenas maybe caught one or maybe one got a snake bite. We do not know exactly what happened to the third one but currently we got two uh, we've got two of uh, these uh, sisters here, and as I said earlier, we call this pride the Mogoro pride. It's another one there, very good. Now this is the second one, and a friend of mine told me most probably they got a kill where they are. Blending in very well, and they're not very far from the Mara River, which would translate, should they get thirsty at one point, they'll go have a drink. Elephant grass in general is not very palatable and not many herbivores will eat it and they could use it for shade for the better part of the day. Is one pride I've never known why they're never successful in bringing litters up. Of course, once in a while they'll be pregnant and they give birth to the cubs and then they will lose the litter. you'd like to know how many lion prides we have in the Mara. I'll start counting them one after the other as one of the sisters going close to the other. But they are over 10. They are over 10, quite a number. Now, Riley, this is the very first one we're doing. And this one here is called the Mogoro Pride. Earlier, we were watching another female that was tucked in a cold place, and that is called the Oloro Pride. Of all the many prides that we got in the Masimara, one of them, or oh, my favorite one, is called the Sausage Tree Pride. Those are three. Then there's another one called the Owino Pride. Those are four. We got another one called the Paradise Pride. That's a five. We got another one called the Riverbank Pride, six. And we got another one that is called, let me get the name. Uh, I'll get the name for you, but give or take, we got about 10 prides where we are in the Mara Triangle. But of course, there could be a pride that we do not know. But the ones we have followed, the prides we can identify positively are 10 prides. Not sure exactly what she wants to do, but she went close to the sister. We cannot see the kill from where we are. But I think it must be under this elephant grass somewhere stashed in to keep it fresh. Big, and we all are convinced, all the people out in the bush, that these two girls are pregnant. And I'm just hoping that they're going to have some litter. Not sure how old they are in the pregnancy. They're going to bring their litter through. So what I want to do is just to wait a little bit patiently and see if they might lead us to the kill. I just want to mention something here quickly now. You see the ears twitching there? This cat is on the absolute brink of going for something. Those of you who have watched, whether it's lions, leopards, domestic cats, Iberian lynx, bobcats, small spotted cats, any any kind of cat, okay, will know that what this cat is doing, you know, as they, when they're ready to pounce, they'll actually shuffle their back feet and they get like coiled springs. They just tense there. This cat is 100% focused. And what I wanted to say is that, although it's had one attempt, Okay, this cat knows that there's still something in that burrow in front of it, and it's not going to go anywhere until it thinks there's absolutely no chance. It is, these, the species has grown up on the plains of Africa. It's evolved in these conditions. This cat is not going to waste its time if it thinks there's not, a, not an opportunity waiting for it right in front there, in that hole. So, although it's had one attempt, you know, it's not like a lion that's gone for a wildebeest and the wildebeest will run away, and the lion's like, oh, well, Damn, I missed that. And <clears throat> the, this cat could go for whatever's in there any second, literally. I mean, and I, I can't predict that. I just, I know, well, I can predict and say, yeah, it will happen, but I can't say when, unfortunately. So, but that thing is like a coiled spring as it's sitting there. And it's all focus, all focus. It's a 
just in terms of habitat use. Hard beyond is asked, do wildcats maintain a territory? In studies actually in East Africa, they're about four and a half square kilometers, their territory sizes, and they defend them aggressively against other African wildcats. And typically a male range encompassing a number of females, but they'll do all the normal scent marking that, that, that domestic cats would do as well. Sorry, I keep relating it to domestic cats because that is a really nice frame of reference for a lot of people in terms of body size, behavior, breeding, that kind of thing in it. Um, but yeah, so they do maintain territories, and that's why I'm thinking that this may well be the same cat that we saw catch that meerkat the other day. And that being said, remember, <laughs> I could be completely wrong because a territory is not mutually exclusive. We often have this idea that if you've got your territorial boundaries, there's never ingression from another one, from another conspecific into your area. That is not true whatsoever. You maintain your territory boundaries for the reason that you're trying to keep other animals out. The only reason you'll do that is because you know other animals are very likely to come into your area. And that's why you've got to keep patrolling, got to keep scent barking, got to keep calling, whatever it is, to maintain that boundary. And, um, and these territories can be fluid as well. You know, so if you get exceptionally good years, you might have five, six, seven, eight, like really above average rainfall years, those territories can contract. A cat like this is not going to go forage across five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten square kilometers um, if it's got a super abundance of food in a very small area. Um, just the opposite will happen if you're having a drought period and food is very, very scarce, those territories can expand. And that, they will expand to the exclusion of any weaker competitors out there. So in other words, if you've got a, a really old wildcat or a, a new one that's just established a territory and hasn't kind of got its boxing gloves all shiny yet, you know, it's going to be like, uh, all right, those are the ones that are going to get booted in a, in, a, in a case like that. And it's your your prime tough animals that are going to be surviving. But I'm just, I'm so blown away by the sighting this morning. Eh? And I know it just looks like a little dot on the landscape there, but my word, it's good. Sarah's asked, how long do the kittens stay with their mom? It'll be, a, it'll be a couple of months. I'd have to check it up exactly what it is for you. Um, but, it, you know, I'm, I don't have house cats at home, but I'd have to check it up for you. But like I say, the gestation is 56 to 63 days. And so I would guess they'd probably be completely independent by probably less than a year. I like the questions that we don't know the answers to. Those are the good ones. We can go back, look them up, find out. And in terms of why we're on the topic of young and that kind of stuff is they will often breed underground. Remember, we've been looking at things that breed underground, like you know, artfark, our shell ducks, you know, the Shelby family there, um, um, the anteating chats breed underground. We've seen agamas yesterday on the drive going underground. We know pangolins breed underground. It just shows how critically important burrows in this environment are. Um, these cats are no exception. They will norm in this environment, in the Kalahari, they will almost always be breeding underground. Unless you've got a cat that's holding a territory up in the mountains here, in amongst the rocks, then there's a, probably a strong likelihood that they will just breed in amongst rocks and thickets and that. Um, and speaking of mountains, the, the hills here at Swallow are actually quite low. I call them mountains. These are hills. I mean, you can scramble to the top in, in, in an hour's time on most of these hills. Um, but if you look at southern Africa, or let's, let's go South Africa. The highest point is just over 3,500 meters in South Africa in, in what we call the Drakensberg. They haven't been recorded, to my knowledge, on the very top of the Drakensberg Mountains yet. But in East Africa, they have actually been recorded 3,000, just over 3,000 meters in altitude. But in our areas, they tend to be a lot lower. But the, the key thing in terms of their habitat usage, you're looking at a, actually a, a, a very strongly colorate, color, what? Oh, well, good, there goes that word. Anyway, it follows a rainfall pattern. <laughs> yes, uh, oh, that was a word that missed me there. Anyway, I'll think of it just now, don't worry. It follows a rainfall pattern very, very closely. And anything below 100 mils of rain, generally, you won't get African wildcats. 
anything above 100 mils, you're likely to get African wildcats through a range through a range of habitats. So correlate, that's the word. Sorry. He's still in. Oh, that's what I was talking about before. Animal hunting. You don't. You don't. They're not just voracious predators that kill everything that they come across. There is an order to it. There is an order to it, and wildlife have evolved to maintain that order. Obviously, individuals do get killed, but it's not a constant affair. We track lions often. Some nights they're actually very lucky, very successful, and other nights they go for days without hunting. Even the wildcat misses. Okay, so the birds have been going absolutely crazy. Here is a brown-crowned chagra, which is a very cool bird to see in the open. They're often very skulky. You hear that noise? That's where they get the name chagra from. I can't do it, but he did that noise. Listen to them making all their calls. Marvelous fellow. So the brown and black crowned chagras both make that alarm call that you heard, and that's where the name Chagra comes from. T C H A R G R A. Off he goes. You don't often get to see them like that. That was a splendid sighting of a brown crown. And I think they've all woken up and realized there's a whole pride of lions here. So, yes, inbreeding is definitely something that occurs naturally in the wild. Um, although, uh, in natural populations of lions, the, uh, the males, when they have become of age within this pride, by that stage there's generally a pride takeover, and so the males will get pushed away from this pride by new males and they will move and move and move until eventually they're on the other side of the Kruger National Park before they come of age or become dominant and then they mate and breed with females they're not related to. It does happen every now and again uh, that male lions are, form a coalition and they're quite big and strong and they end up staying very close to their natal area so there is chances of inbreeding um, but in wild populations, it's far less removed than it is in a much more sort of closed system. Very closed systems, we have a very high chance of that happening. And closed systems require enormous amount of management. But here in the wild, inbreeding is avoided to a large degree by the fact that the behavior and the movement and the sort of notable sort of changes in dynamics over years. There's a wonderful little foot, isn't it? <laughs> you can see the, the four toes and the three-lobed back pad. How oh, beautiful. Inbreeding is a reality with most animals, in fact, uh, birds as well. But uh, much of their behavior is designed about avoiding that. But it is not, it's not impossible to prevent entirely. Inbreeding leads, leads to genetic loss in genetic fitness, loss in genetic transfer, and leads to deformities as well as um, other issues pertaining to the genetics. But these lions are not bothered at all about a single word that I'm saying.
Welcome back to the river and we have few you know hippos approaching the bank they seem to want to come out yeah looks like two of them hard to tell the gender three um, when they're in the water one thing about them is sometimes you cannot estimate how many are in the water you might see five you always have to, have to say plus minus two or five because it's sometimes difficult to say how many in the they are because they can stay underwater for quite a while unlike us nobody has approached the river yet i'm still here hoping that i will see my first zebra or wildebeest you know come by and cross either way remember it's one of the times when we expect them to be crossing this section of the river it's not always the way you think that they cross every day they do go for a few days or weeks without crossing now it's been in this area it's been almost around five days i am hoping that today is the day because across we cannot see them but using my binoculars i did see a good number of them i have two birds here and the one to the right is a black-headed heron and looks and looks like you know he's cleaning himself maybe he's gonna go out this afternoon same thing with the sacred ibis to the left unusual you know a pair um they don't do anything together apart from you know fishing or probing or eating you know whatever is in the water i'm gonna stick around the river So as you can see, this, there's probably only one thing you're more focused in that wildcat, and that's David and myself on this vehicle. It's like, probably not as focused as that wildcat, to be honest. But um, yeah, that cat is going nowhere, and that's why I don't want to leave you, because that cat's not sunning itself now and just chilling and enjoying the beautiful scenery of the Kalahari. That cat wants breakfast. And you see how it's like focused, looking straight at that hole, head pointed down, but you see how the ears keep twitching? Yes, and I would love to know what discussion is going on under the ground there now. It's like, but I told you to watch out for it. I told you, I told you last night that cat would be here this morning. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. Remember when you put the keys down, I said, watch out for the wild cat. <laughs> no. Maybe we're going to see a breakfast meal, a breakfast snack. So I wonder who's in that burrow. Yes. Is it a rodent? Is it a squirrel? Can we zoom in more, David? Or is it like, I think we max there. Oh, we're going to touch more. Is that, <laughs> is that the touch? <laughs> Guys, I'm really sorry. Like I say, I can't afford... I can't afford to start the vehicle and try and move closer because I'll just, you know, yeah, we'll just um, we'll just disturb the sighting. And remember, Acha, what we're seeing here is the very, very pinnacle of survival for this cat. Its entire evolution over millions of years has come to this one focal point. Okay. We had an artist at Swale recently, and this, I know this is going to sound like a bit of a crazy analogy here. We had a fantastic landscape artist for our artist in residence program, a, a, a gentleman called Bruce Backhouse, does magnificent landscape paintings. And he said to me, you know, someone once asked him, but, you know, your paintings, they, they sell for X, Y, Z. How can you, how can they be selling for that? Because you know, you, it, takes you, it only takes you two or three days to do a painting like it. And you know what Bruce said? He said, no, it doesn't take me three days to do that painting. That painting has taken me 60 years of experience to do. 
and how that relates to the thing like a wildcat, what we sitting seeing here, for me personally, this is my own personal view, I'm not sitting here and seeing an African wildcat about to have some breakfast. I'm sitting watching the point of millions of years of evolution. That cat, think, this cat growing up as a kitten, its parents, its parents' parents, its parents' parents' parents, like going back hundreds of thousands of generations that has honed this cat to this point where it can sit in front of that hole and catch that thing. We are seeing the pinnacle of evolution here, and this is just mind-blowing. Welcome back to Anvion Pinda, everybody, where we found a white rhino bull on a bit of a territory patrol. He keeps coming around to that particular patch where he is now. There's quite a bit of dung there that he keeps smelling. But you see that tail curled up, which is often a sign of distress or sort of you know, alertness for them. He keeps scraping his back feet. He might do it again and then spraying his urine back on that. And he could potentially be the, or he probably is the dominant bull in this area. And perhaps someone else has come to challenge him. And if that is the case, that bull will defecate in his same mitten and scrape his feet. So that's probably why he's got his tail curled up. He's not happy that someone's now in his territory uh, coming to challenge him. He came for a bit of a drink and then he did it twice. He scraped his back feet, sprayed, and now he's continuing walking but interesting to see that back tail or that tail of his still curled up as he walks away from us caked in mud as well maybe from yesterday it's all quite dry now but yesterday found himself in a bit of a wallow everyone commenting on how big this particular bull is he is massive probably in his prime and still on ice Relax a little bit, that tail's going back to its nut. Might just see a little bit of a spray every so often if he is spraying bushes as he goes along. With that tail, lovely backdrop as well behind him. But you can see just how wide he is as he walks away from us now. He is particularly large, upwards of about two, two and a half tons, which is heavier than the vehicle that we in. Just to put that in perspective, as he disappears, he's probably now smelt that trail of that bull who's now come to into his territory to potentially find him. But driving out in the open, this is the first rhino that we've come across today. Now that the wind's picked up, maybe sticking to the thicker areas. In this pan in front of us, a couple of birds, red bull quillas coming down to drink. as that rhino disappears over the horizon we are we've ended up exactly where we left those three young male lions yesterday so might just drive around and see if we can't find them again a couple of other birds around this watering hole the crown lapwing Victoria you're asking if lions ever hunt rhino uh, not that I've ever seen. I have seen hyena on the other hand giving a, a white rhino mom and her very young calf quite a, a hard time. I know one of the guys at Angala also saw that to the point where they actually managed to, I think it was, he said it was three hyena, it was Eric from Angala and he said it was probably the, one of the hardest things he's had to watch but three hyena that kept on Sort of attacking one would rest and the other two would try and tire this rhino out and eventually it just succumbed so i've never heard of of lions attacking them maybe a small small calf
watches, watches, watches. This cat is so ready to snaffle someone. You can just see how tense that is, that entire body is just waiting to go. I'm just glad that you could see it slightly from a different angle now. Oh my goodness, this is just incredible. That tension, eh? This is just patience, eh? this is just absolute, absolute patience. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Just, I just got up from the left, moved to the right, and then came down and we actually, when Jandre, and Jandre was still here, we actually witnessed one doing exactly this. It was sitting for ages at a burrow entrance, and then it moved around, to the, and it took a completely different angle when it tried to catch something. So this cat is 100% onto something, and it's not going anywhere, and neither are we. Oh, they're settling down now, it's settling, it's settling, it's settling. Okay, so I think that that, that key hunting moment just passed there now. But this cat, the way it's settled in like that, it's not going anywhere. This cat is still going to try, still going to give another attempt. So that's been two attempts now in the past hour and a half, an hour. And we're going to see, we're going to see a third one. <clears throat> Anna Maria has asked, do the cats ever raid bird nests? They have been known to raid bird nests. Um, but particularly ground nesting birds. Things like uh, lapwings, horses, Korans, uh, spotted thick knees, those kind of things. So your ground nesting birds are the ones most likely to fall prey to African wildcats. Not so much um, actually nests in trees. Oh, I'm so excited about this. And like I'm saying, guys, we are seeing the pinnacle of an evolutionary process. Yeah, this is not just, oh, there's a cat like sitting out in the open in the morning enjoying itself and everything that it's, everything that, that its entire lineage has gone through is focused on this one, one point in time that we are sitting and witnessing right now. This is insanely mind-blowing. Oh, my goodness, this is amazing. My goodness, I'm in heaven now. Just lots of patience needed, that's all it is. Lots of patience. <laughs> Victoria says if she had to sit and wait like this for a meal, she would starve to death out of irritation. <laughs> it's a good thing you're not an African wildcat then, eh? Because this is, this is what the existence revolves around. Any predators, eh? You know, you, that's why they kind of that adage, the patience of a predator. You know, if you don't have that, you die. Simple as that. You know, I think it is a, certainly a frustrating frustrating thing for many guests is, you know, as a guide, you go out and you get a sighting like this and you say, guys, just be patient, trust us. You will see some action. And you sit there for an hour or two hours and the guests kind of start getting a little bit antsy and, you know, they feel that you're not like actually putting in effort and we should be actively driving around doing something because people are like it you know if you're doing something you you seem to be achieving an end and often that's just the complete opposite and that's the big thing in life eh? remember that it's not what you do that's important it's what you perceived to be doing that's important a wise guide once told me that and i've never forgotten it so eh?
So even if you're achieving absolutely nothing by driving around, if people perceive that as you doing something constructive, they'll be quite happy, even though you try to explain to them, well, that actually we're not achieving much. You're achieving far more by sitting in one spot with this African wildcat than you are driving around randomly. Pearls of wisdom on this Monday morning. Well, there is lots of joy to keep watching that wild cat. Well, my big cat here moved from where she was earlier, and she has taken a very different position from where the killer I think is. She has walked about a hundred meters, and I got a feeling it was getting too hot for her, and the elephant grass she was under was not giving her enough shade. Oh, she has taken a different bush, a bigger shade, more solid, and maybe more guaranteed for the rest of the day. For those of you who could be joining us now, this is the pride that we call the Mogoro pride. Two girls, two sisters, and we've got a feeling uh, both of them are pregnant. You can tell from the panting, it has gotten pretty hot, looking on the amount of sunshine just around her. Typical, if they are full and there's somewhere they can get some water, that is exactly how they'll behave for the rest of the day. You can see the juggler vein, how the heartbeat's going, because either we could be having some cubs uh, in her uterus, and maybe there could be a lot of flesh in her belly. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, should you have any questions or comments, you're welcome to send them through. You can tweet to us, hashtag CGTN Wild or hashtag Wild Earth. Polly, it's very, for very good reason, Polly, Lions will hang around at the crossing point because we have seen and they know chances are you'll get a wildebeest that will either fracture its legs, or in the process of that confusion and the stampede and the pandemonium when they're trying to cross uh, the river, they get very nervous. And what these lionesses or lions will do is just to lay ambush, and they know chances are they'll definitely get something. It's not only the lions, also the crocs that of course will be underwater will do the same. So we're not very far from the Mara River, and should we have any crossing from where we are, this lioness and the sister will get a wildebeest or even a zebra down. This they have known with time and experience, and they'll always know the best thing to do, hang around where the food is. Many predators, including lions or wild dogs or leopards or cheetahs, will always take the easiest way to get food to themselves. The shortest route, where they know they are not going to struggle very much, they're not going to run very much, and a place like a riverbank is one good example of such uh, a possibility. Oh, did you just turn around? Now that's having a proper snooze for typical lioness. I'll stick around with her for quite some time and see uh, what she does next. And I'm watching to see what these antelope do next because there are lots of leopard tracks around here. And there's even some fresh leopard scats. So I'm having a look for the last hour, driving about and trying to track, but no luck just yet. So I'm hoping that these are wonderful kudu and there's some impala amongst them too. I hope that they'll be able to help me by giving me an indication. There's a slight breeze now, so the scent of a leopard would carry. But so far, everyone is very relaxed. Now, many of the antelope that are, that are here, the females, they may be pregnant. We know the impalas, those ewes will definitely be pregnant. These kudus, they don't have an exact breeding season, but they always want to birth when 
resources are most abundant at the end of the year. And it's a really, really interesting story, the way that they go about this and the males rut and compete. I think we should learn a little bit more about them. Impala are Southern Africa's most common antelope. So we often don't give them the attention they deserve. They are athletic, graceful, beautiful and hugely successful. In May, they are also the funniest creature in the bush. The ram's testosterone levels skyrocket, causing them to hate each other and love the ewes. They set up little territories with violence and astonishingly loud guttural burps, chasing away their rivals and herding the ladies. Early winter is filled with chaotic battles and frightening roaring. The rutting carnival is a dangerous time for the rams. They forget to eat or look out for predators. But the mating madness only lasts a few months. After this, the anger and vendettas are forgotten and peace is restored. The males can be ridiculous with the sounds that they make, the way that they posture, the way that they advertise themselves and herd the females. It's one of the noisiest times in the bush when impala rams start their rutting and the burps are something very, very special. When you first hear it, you don't think that it, those sounds could come from impalas, but they certainly do. But the problem with that is that during that time, they take a little bit less care with being vigilant and alert and they care a lot more about advertising to females. Sometimes they'll be noisily roaring, that's what it's called actually. But in fact, they can't hear or listen or basically they don't care about the predators. Anyway, guys, this is happening live. You're watching CGTN's Digital Safari and talk to us. Use the hashtag CGTNWild or hashtag WildEarth and we'll be ready to chat to you. Hello everybody, welcome back to Juma, where we've got a lioness grooming herself. Animals, lions, cats, they have an impulse to groom. It's a constant thing that they do. And if you've ever smelt a lion, it's actually quite, you think about it, it's quite bizarre how much they do groom themselves because the smell, oof, <laughs> it's never very pleasant. But that is what they are. They are lions. They smell like lions, and no doubt they also taste like lions. Sugar bits, you want to know why they have black pads on their paws? Well, if you shave a lion down, you see the, the cats as we've seen them with the mange, their fur, underneath the fur, the skin is actually dark. So they've got quite a dark skin. Um, and a, a lot of that is possibly to do with protection. Uh, a melanin in nature, in feathers, is the black. And it actually makes feathers harder. And around lions' mouths, you notice around the gums, it's also black. And then on the pads, and their pads, same as leopards, moving around and walking around, 
um, are dark because the melanin obviously helps to strengthen the skin, uh, possibly even adds some form of sun protection to it, but it definitely makes it tougher. Um, and around the mouth, because of the feeding, the bones, the claws and teeth, um, it needs to be a bit tougher there as well, otherwise they'll just bleed uncontrollably. So that is my thoughts. Um, but if you do shave a lion all the way down, not that it's something I've ever done, but when we've seen the mange and they've scraped themselves raw, the skin underneath is actually dark. So it's probably the entire body is like that. Adds a little bit of strength. They're very tough animals. They take a beating. They get all sorts of injuries. And their skin needs to be very tough. So everybody, it's quiz time this morning. It's quiz time this morning. So um, I've got a very easy quiz for you. Very, very easy one. We're with the Pride of Lions. So let's stick with lions, shall we? Um, let's talk about gestation period. What number of days? You can say months, but let's try go with days. How many days, days is the average lion gestation period? And that is the pregnancy period from fertilization to birth. How many days? If you can guess it, a few days left or right of the mark is okay. Or if you happen to say months, months will be all right as well. But uh, it is a bit more specifically days. So if you could go with that, hashtag wild earth, hashtag CGTN wild. How many days is a lion pregnant for? Obviously they give birth to pretty very small cubs, anywhere from one to six, with two to four being the average. And they give birth to them very underdeveloped, very, very need of parental protection. As you can see, this pride's cubs are all above seven, eight months old already, and they're still very reliant on the pride for survival. Up until 14, 15 months, these young lions are going to be very, very reliant on the lionesses. After a year, they'll start contributing a little bit more to the actual hunting, but uh, they really aren't much of a benefit to the pride, except as an eating machine on the side requiring a lot more food. Still here, and I'm, I'm still here at the river, and I have been joined by more birds. Those ones are Egyptian geese, and that is a pair. Usually, when they are not breeding, you will see them together. Until when they start breeding, then you'll see one, because always one is watching from day one when they have one egg until the eggs hatch. Yeah, um, here at the river, the, at the moment, uh, there is nobody in sight, but it doesn't mean that it is the way it's gonna be the whole day. Um, wildlife usually has its own way of working things. And as it warms up now, uh, it started out to be around 26 degrees Celsius here in the Mara. The temperatures increase and so the urge to how quench thirst and thirst increases so they will head to the river you know as the temperature rise and once they get to the river usually uh, they always make a decision to cross so anytime we might be seeing them trickle down it has been a day so i'd say about two days without them coming remember when they cross they don't cross every day I'm staking out about three crossings 
and I've been moving up and down. I don't know if you've noticed the banks do change every now and then when I move. This one particularly, I'm thinking uh, it's going to be the cross main crossing because I've seen Topi and Zebra here and um, the Zebra crossed yesterday, just a few of them. So when they come back, they will use this. For some reason, they do change crossings. They, they move from one to the other. So I am thinking this one is going to be you know, the one they're going to use. Uh, if they don't, there is one behind me and another one in, you know, to my left further up so uh that's why i'm sticking around this area and i uh, promise you in the next you know few days or even this afternoon we might share a crossing because there is still quite a lot of wildebeest across the other side but during the crossing remember it doesn't happen every day it can happen you know even seven times in a day but when it stops, it can go from one, two, three, four, even five days, and then they start coming back. So um, just to inform you, during the migration, they crisscross from one area to the other. The crossing, uh, so the huge one was a very long way up, but that's rarely, rarely crossed because once they reach there, there's nowhere else to go. But here I am, I'm waiting, I'm sticking out. Remember to talk to me on hashtag CGTN Wild and hashtag Wild Earth. Uh, that's where you can ask me questions that are disturbing you about why am I here? Should I be here? Uh, do I know what I'm doing? Maybe things like that. Um, you can always, you know, question me there. You know, your comment is very much welcome you need to know about the migration i am here lisa beautiful question uh, very very good question has there been an year where wildebeest have never crossed the river my answer through experience is no they have always crossed I'll tell you to find or use the magic Google, Google and find a map of the Mara. You know, for them to go to the triangle, they have to cross the river. For them to cross from Tanzania to one side of the reserve, they have to cross the river. And once they're in the triangle, if they would need to go to Greater Mara, they'll have to cross the river. For some reason, if you look at the map, I'm explaining it's like you have it there, but maybe you might use it, uh, you might use this when you have a map. If you look at the map, there is a river called Sun River. It stretches from the east of the lower part of Mara and top of Serengeti and cuts down all the way to Mara River. They do cross that. Usually it doesn't have much water. If they cross that and went on east, they would not cross the river. But because they're wildebeest and they've never read books, they always turn west and that forces them to cross the river. That is, you know, um, my answer to you, Lisa. You know, they always cross the river. There has never been an year where they've never crossed. And that is always the ultimate experience you know, after seeing the hundreds and thousands, you know, seeing them cross is always the uh, sherry on the cake, uh, the icing on the cake. Yeah, more questions um, are very much welcome. Uh, keep me busy here at the river. Um, that hippo, uh, he wasn't there. I think he, he just he just came here. He just came there, or he was there. I hadn't seen him. So I'm still here. Think of those, you know, interesting questions. And um, yeah, let's um, talk about this beautiful phenomenon. Yeah, so our, our little wildcat is still catching some zeds. A catnap. Someone was going to say that. I know it. Admit it. But we are not going anywhere. Because that cat will go from zero to hero in about 
0 0.2 milliseconds if it even hears a peep or a squeak downstairs. And that's what I want to wait for. So the, it's interesting, so the, the, there's a theory called the green world hypothesis. I'm just kind of like relating this on something slightly different to predators and that. And like, and the traditional way of thinking was like, you know, you got like sunlight and plants photosynthesizing and, you know, so you got this like typical food pyramid with like this massive stuff at the bottom and then all these successive like layers building up, building up. And then you got these one or two small numbers of predators sitting right at the top. And then um, in the 60s, that was kind of like all turned on its head when a couple of very, very, very bright young scholars came along and said, well, actually, hang on. Perhaps it's not as all as simple as it seems. That this, like, it, they called it the Etonian Pyramid, Eltonian Pyramid. You know, this, this like bottom-up, typical pyramid shape on a, on a food, food, like the food cycle and that. And... Um, these guys came along and they proposed something slightly different. So, well, actually, what is driving, what is preventing all those herbivores from eating every single last scrap of vegetation they can find? Because why not? You know, if you, and we know, if you put X amount of animals in an X size area, they will eat everything that they can. So what, in a natural system, what is preventing that happening? And they kind of like threw the whole ecological world on, on its head there because that was a traditional way of thinking. And they just said, well, what if we ascribe an inordinate amount of importance to the role of predators in an ecosystem? So instead of looking at it from this big classic pyramid shape, you've now got these this tiny number of predators sitting at the top and having an inordinately large impact on the environment below them. And that's really what's going on out here. Predation is one of the key, key, key driving forces in maintaining ecosystem health. Doesn't matter what ecosystem, pick an ecosystem. I challenge anyone to pick an ecosystem to point out where there's no predator there. Ecosystems that don't have predators are degenerate and dysfunctional in the long run. No questions. Welcome back, everybody, to Anbound Pinda, where we've come across a small herd, or at the moment, tower of giraffe. You can see the female in picture has, or is busy tucking into a tamboti tree with a really sort of red, orangey, green leaves. She manipulates, wraps her tongue around them, and then just pulls her head to the side to strip it of all those leaves she's busy eating on. And if we pick one of those leaves, it's got that very milky latex, which for people or humans, not great, but a firm favorite for, for this particular giraffe, as you can see. Porcupines will often eat at the base of the tree, and then black rhino will eat tambotis as well. And all three females, we can tell that just by looking at the ossicle or horns on top of their heads, they still have that black hair on, on top. Males are typically bald because of the, the necking or the fighting that they do. Just watching this one, it's got that really, really long leathery tongue that wraps around to eat. Lions ate my mum is asking if we ever get unusually short or small or unusually tall giraffe. Every so often you, uh, I've seen a, a really, really big bull, a giraffe bull, which seems larger than life, but sometimes it's just because they're on their own and you've got no one else to compare them to. And then if you watched the show a couple of days ago, Damon found a really, really small giraffe. That was just because it had recently been born and it still had its umbilical cord on. But not unusually like a dwarf or anything like that. Uh, lions ate my mum. I've never seen uh, a sort of pocket-sized giraffe, no. And you can see where 
where they feed often you'll find what they call a browse line so that you just see that very sort of thick greenery and the, the tips of these branches have all been stripped clean and those trees particularly where Isaac has been recording from in the, in the Maasai a lot of those trees have that browse line so that it looks like somebody shaved underneath of them they'll do that just things like Nyala will often also eat specific trees that then have that browse line where they just can't reach any further up but this one here eating that tambuti has tucked itself right into that tree to get to the top of it and it hasn't stopped feeding the entire morning while we've been here lovely crisp clean coat just looking a little bit further down back to Juma. I'll come back to the Unkuma Pride who are all making their way in, into the shade. As in that time of day, we've repositioned ourselves to get you a better view. And uh, we had a nice view for a moment and now they're all deciding that uh, the wonderful lights on their faces actually look too warm. So let's hear what answers we came up with in the quiz. Janet, you reckon 60 days? 60 days is a little bit short, Janet. Very short, actually. That's a, a little bit longer than 60 days. Spring crossing into... Andrew and Patty, you're close there. You're close with your 90 days, three months. Very close, but a little bit longer for the most part. Um, both lions and leopards are very similar, just over three months. Oh, Carly, there we go. Carly says 110 days. Now, it can be anywhere from 108 to 110. Obviously, um, th there's no hard and fast exact to it, but um, 108, 110, so about 15 weeks or so. Very, very good. So three months, three and a bit months, it's a very short period of time, if you think about it, eh? Very, very short period of time. Uh, but that is why the cubs are born as what we call precocial. Um, if the lions, when they're hunting, to have very large babies inside their belly will influence them, no doubt, will influence them. Uh, influence their hunting, they need to be quick, they need to be agile, they need to be flexible. And having large babies inside the belly, imagine having six large babies inside your stomach. It would be very hard to do anything. Um, and um, so they give birth to them very underdeveloped and they require a lot of parental care. And they're very vulnerable at that stage. When you flip it on its head and you look at antelope species, including zebra and a giraffe and, and the like, wildebeest, buffalo, they all try to give birth to, to babies that are far more developed, so they're able to move when they're born. A lion cub, leopard cub, is born blind, it's born um, completely helpless, and it can't really move anywhere. It can move around trying to find um, mum's mammary gland, and that's about it. If you've ever looked at puppies being born, it's the same sort of story. They're just these little things, blind, moving around, trying to survive. Whereas antelope hit the ground running because uh, their survival depends on it. You know, sometimes it only takes a few minutes for an antelope calf or lamb or foal or whatever you want to call it from the zebras. And it takes a few minutes for them to get up on their feet and uh, their herd moves. And if they're not able to keep up, they get left behind. It's a very dangerous time for them, of course, but uh, the parents go through a lot longer gestation period and then give birth to what we call precocial offspring, offspring that are a bit more adept to dealing with life. Obviously, they're still dependent on mum for milk, uh, but they can walk around and they can follow. They can keep up with the herds, especially in migratory herds, such as buffalo, or should I say movable herds, mobile herds like buffalo, migratory herds such as the wildebeest. And it's another reason why wildebeest and impala, for example, 
have what we call flooding the market breeding, where they give birth to many, many, many small babies at the same time, which gives a huge percentage of them a much better chance of survival. Well, I stopped here to show you these uh, zebras. And not because we didn't have zebras before, but I'm just looking at how they have posed. And I think this is a great family portrait. And having one single uh, lone wildebeest behind them, the color is so good. And the times we do photography uh, competition in wildlife, and I was just talking, let's go very quickly fast to swallow. Yeah, guys, sorry, this cat got up, it went to the toilet, and now it's just ambling off there again. Um, anyway, I think the time that you spent with it was exceptional. And, um, and you can just see how relaxed it is, just slinking away there. This has been a, nothing short of a remarkable sighting. So everyone that had the patience to sit with us, Kirsty for having the patience to put up with my crazy quick links every now and again. Thank you very much, everyone. That was just an insane African wildcat sighting of, like, yeah. What a birthday present for me, huh? How cool is that? Got it, David? There's it ambling out there. There he goes. There you can get a nice idea of the size of the cat compared to Africa, uh, a domestic cat. And it's the one of the, there's two typical features that, that distinguish them from uh, from hybrids. Red behind the ears, which this one has, and long legs. The legs are considerably longer than a, yes, what, that is absolutely stunning to watch it like that. Camouflage, as we were saying just now, when it was lying sleeping there, if we'd driven past at that point with this light, we would never have seen that cat. And I'm really glad you're all seeing it actually moving through this landscape now. Jeez, that is just unbelievable. And don't worry about the time of day on this cat. Eh? This cat will catch, this cat will catch something regardless of the time of day. So even if it's, especially now when these temperatures actually aren't that hot, that cat will gobble someone up in a heartbeat if it bumps into someone. And you know, remember now that the cat's moving, you're also getting other things moving, like meerkats and squirrels. And you see those stripes on the legs? Also very, very typical of an African wildcat. What a sighting this is. I don't know how many of you have ever seen African wildcats this clearly before, but this is just a particularly good sighting. Yes, this is ridiculously good. Oh man, I love this is amazing. And I know I keep saying this, but this is, coming from me that has been here almost 16 years now, and I just can't get enough of seeing things like this. It's just, I, oh my word. Just seeing that cat on the prowl, and it's, it's hunting now. It's not, it's not like just going for a stroller. This cat is hunting. He obviously lost interest, and I'm pretty happy that, to say that this is a Tom. I'm just going on the, you know, the, the bulk of the, you know, the body. It's a nice, strong looking cat. They get to over six kilograms, by the way, just out of interest, these males. Four, between four and 6.4, that's what the range is there. And the females are constantly lighter, kind of three to four kgs. Wow, 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 wow. 
Well, I, everybody is excited to have seen that World Cup and Daylan well done. My zebras have remained in the same position. And you remember earlier, I was talking about the times we do uh, photography competition here uh, in the Masimara. And I was talking to Bunge on the camera today, and I thought, if we could have, you know, uh, be doing that competition currently, I think this could be a very good candidate to win. It has warmed up, and this is exactly what most of the zebras will do. Slow down, stop eating, enjoy the sun, keep, you know, walking their tails. During the migration, we'll always see hyenas or the predators hunting. People have always thought hyenas only scavenge, but they are also very good hunters. They do not only hunt wildebeest, zebras too, and zebras are no exception. The arrival of the migration is a festival for the predators of the Mara. With herds exhausted from fighting through the currents and surviving the snapping of the crocodiles, Herds are often faced with further torment from awaiting hyenas. This time, it was the North clan waiting to take advantage of the confusion. <laughs> hyenas are calculating, ducking and diving the herds, probing for any weaknesses. Finally, these hyenas found one. A zebra, its stomach torn open by a crocodile. A lone stallion, especially an injured one, is no match for a salivating clan of hyenas. But this zebra put up a fight, albeit briefly. Eventually, the stallion's strength faded, and the North clan ran in to finish what the perilous river had started, mercifully ending his suffering. The migration is a plentiful time of both turmoil and spoils. How exciting is that? So, as I was saying earlier, people will always think hyenas will always scavenge, but hyenas to me are some of the best predators that we got in Africa. I mean, they're very successful, more even than the lions. Sometimes I think they're even more successful than the leopards. Nice to have seen those zebras. So what I want to do is to head out uh, towards the river and find out what could be happening. We could see some crossing, who knows? So, Sebastian and I at Pridelands have discovered something quite interesting that was not here about an hour and a half ago when we drove down this road. Afterbirth plus something from a rather large animal, a rhino or an elephant, but I'm not sure what. Both of their tracks are going down this road, which is really, really fascinating. Now, yesterday, Sebastian and I were watching a big breeding herd of elephants, and one of them looked heavily pregnant, and she looked very unimpressed. But, you know, I'm not sure what has happened here, because I've walked around, well, both Sebastian and I have walked around, and we cannot find a patch where there has, um, you know, where, where an animal has obviously given birth. You, can, you would clearly be able to see that. So... I don't know if, it, and there's no drag mark here either. So I don't know if this animal has had a miscarriage or, I, I honestly, I'm speechless and I have absolutely no idea, but it's fascinating though. And look at all, actually what you can see that's quite cool is that there's a lot of ants that have come through. This is another thing that we know that it is so fresh is because um, it's nice and warm. So the insects will be active and the most prominent insect around at the moment are termites and ants. And you can see all these tiny little ants here, I'm just going to point with my knife, um, have come to feed on here. So some kind of carnivorous ant. I've also seen some Matabele ants coming through, which are these rather large black ants, um, and feeding on it. And I'm sure there'll be some pugnacious ants, which are also carnivorous that'll come and devour this, but this shouldn't stay here for too long. The hyena dens are not too far away, um, or even some birds of prey might come down and feed on this. This will be very nutritious for them. And uh, yeah, anything, jackals, any small predators. But it's fascinating though, to see something like this. 
No, it's, I think Steve was asking if it could be a giraffe after birth. Potentially, but I don't. There's no tracks. There's no, only tracks of animals that I've seen here are from a... Uh, rhino and from a herd of elephants and I know the elephants are not too far away from here so I honestly I haven't I haven't got a clue I don't think elef do elephants eat their afterbirth I haven't seen it I've seen yeah yeah so we're, we're not sure it could pot potentially be a placent uh, uh, from like an after uh, I can't English now like a miscarriage or something, because like I said, there's no soaked area where an animal has given birth, and who knows? I mean, it's a mystery. It is a big mystery, but it's fascinating. Anyways, just to see, but we thought we'd just quickly have a look. We will drive around and try and find the elephants. That's what we've been doing all morning long to see if we can catch them, but they're just hiding away. But the sun is baking on us, and the water is not too far away. Welcome back everybody to Andrea um, Pinder. It's just about to go across the road in front of us with a whole lot of hitchhikers. You see all those built ox pickers on their backs, but particularly small calves in this herd. Uh, some that whose horns haven't even started appearing just yet. There's one whose horns have just started appearing. There's one who walked past earlier, is walking around, around very gingerly. Probably not born right now but I'd say in the, at least the past couple of days but you just staring at them a lot of ear flicking tail wagging those ox pickers working overtime digging in their ears and around the softer parts of their rump where things like ticks might gather slowly moving away we actually found another herd of buffalo further back uh, separate to this herd yeah, and you can now see quite a few cows who have those thinner horns or, or boss as they call it and then a couple of males that are coming up behind them we'll try and see if we can't point one or two out with that th very thick boss or set of horns but nice to see some very small calves in and amongst this herd particular chap that's standing in the middle of the road now, got about or very short, uh, five, six odd centimeter horns, a little bit lighter in color as well compared to the rest of the herd, but I'm sure it's slowly start turning that very dark color. Here's one, an even younger one standing below mom on the road now, underneath, <laughs> funny looking with those ears below, it's almost in line with its eyes and those horns that have literally just started poking it out of its head now. All busy feeding as they go along and again into the the wind. mowing the grass as they go. I'm sure being such a hot day they might find a bit more of a sheltered patch or a shady patch maybe over the top of the seal down below into the valley to spend the, the heat of the day. Nearest watering hole is again quite far from where they are so they might eventually head back back there. Just looking back over to our right both herds are now going in opposite directions so not Part of the same herd, two separate herds that we've now come across here. Let's see where Craig's going off into the distance is that other herd that we spoke about. And with them up on the hillside were more, a uh, couple of zebra, and beyond them were well, a couple of wildebeest that have now made an appearance. But because it's so dry, and if we use the aid of our binoculars from a distance, you can scan. And often because they, they now stick out like sore thumbs, those very dark shapes on the hillsides. Upon closer inspection, it was them. One or 
one or two, just looking through the binoculars again, one or two really big bulls in that herd. The herd's still having a look at us, but I'm sure they'll carry on grazing throughout the morning. Yes, they will probably keep grazing as our lion new to snooze. Isn't that just the cute? Hmm, I must say, but you want to know the oldest lion on record? In the wild, I'm not actually sure. I mean, lionesses get older than males in, in the wild, and you probably get up to 16 years, maybe a little bit older. I don't know. I've never known a, a lioness older than that. But I think there are probably records. But obviously in in captivity, without the, the pressures of, of the wilderness, without the pressures of big game and hunting and other lions, these animals can live up to older. They can probably get to their 20s, maybe even more. Uh, due to the fact that they don't get injured. Uh, but out here, there are so many perils in the life of a lion that they don't generally live. Wow. Okay, so I just had a little bird whisper in my ear that the oldest lion on record is 29 years old. Now, that was most certainly in a zoo, some form of captivity where it didn't have to hunt buffalo. It didn't have to move around all the time they got food provided for them out here male lions 10 is a good age for male lion females 13 14 15 years old it's a good age for them obviously anything can happen before that but uh, you don't really get male and females living older than the numbers i just gave you there's just way too much that goes on out here you can only hunt so many buffalo before one smashes you. Um, and unfortunately, the injuries that are incurred might not kill an animal outright, but it can lead to them losing condition. I don't know if you, any of you were able to see Hukumuri the other day with James, but um, Hukumuri is a big male leopard who's been in this area, and he got in a fight with uh, another male leopard, Molwati, on the 22nd of June. And he came away from that with an injured front right foot. And since then, Theo saw him the other day, I just saw pictures. Since then, he has lost so much weight, so much condition. And we don't know what's going to happen. He might, he might fix himself. But once animals lose condition to a point due to injury, it becomes harder and harder to bring themselves back. Uh, and lions have it easier than, than leopards do. Male lions have the ability to just follow the pride and keep stealing food from them. But uh, if it's a debilitating injury, uh, that can often lead to, to their downfall very, very quickly. We see them going from very good condition to get quite a bad injury and they can spiral out and they can lose, very, lose condition extremely fast. Extremely fast. It's a tough business being a lion. Tough business from the beginning till the end. That lion doesn't think so. He thinks it's got a golden life ahead in the safety of the pride. Hasn't yet managed to jump on the back of a buffalo, that one, but it'll learn about the power of a buffalo in the next, in the coming years. Welcome back to the and now I have moved and I have found this and these are the corn zebra, the bachelor zebra they're called, it's the same animal many names Bachel's zebra or the common zebra yeah in Maasai it's called Oloitigo and in my tribe it's called Sigiriot and uh, these are part of the migrating ones they have been separated but for sure they'll be joined by the coming herds 
in the next coming days. I don't know how many, but they'll be joined. Uh, they'll head back to the Serengeti. We do have residents that stick around, but until the wildebeest is gone, we normally don't know who's gonna stay or who's gonna go. And that's why I'm saying they will join the huts and move on because I don't know if they're gonna stay or not. Yeah, and that's in the middle there. You can tell he's got a slightly thicker mane or neck. I would say that he is the male over there and a very beautiful, um, like, um, neck hairs, a mane. Yeah, remember uh, the zebras, all stripes are very different. Look at the last one heading away. Look at his backside. Looks like it had a bad, you know, injury there. Do you see that, James? Looks like... Um, got mauled by a lion, but it healed. That is, that was a very serious, that's a very serious car. I don't know if you all see that. It actually has deformed its backside slightly. You can tell it's much lower. I don't know if it affects it from kicking or running, but it looks like when it was raw, must have been a very serious one. These, these animals, um, there's no enough and vets to take all of them most of them heal by themselves and they have amazing antibodies amazing amazing when i say amazing i have seen some injuries with animals you think you know they will die the next day and then in six six months down the line you see you see them you know surviving beautiful giraffe same maasai giraffe is the only one we find here and our largest african antelope to the left eland very shy always very hard to get close to in Swahili it's called Pofu yeah and they go Minesh uh, had your name um, but I didn't get the question I'm gonna move forward slightly while I try and get back the question so that I can answer you. Minesh, you asked me at what age do giraffes start to stop growing? Uh, I would say because they live up to 25 years, I would give it maybe a good 14 years, but I'm not sure. I would say I don't know. So maybe you know Minesh, um, you can tell me, but I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't know when they stop growing. I would guess it would be around 14, 15 years. But I don't know. Yes, so we are back there with our beautiful giraffe. Uh, from the ears I have seen giraffes, I've seen them, their necks, you know, bend slightly as they age. To the left there is a warthog. I don't know you see it, guys. He just appeared, I think. He was asking why I'm not talking about him or her. Yeah, those that's another one that we find here. Very successful. You'd think, you know, they'll disappear off these plains, but they blend in very well with this tall grass and they are able to survive. They do get a very, you know, harsh beating when everybody's gone. You know, lions really take advantage of them. And they get really they really get hammered but you know, they still do very, very well. Remember, it's not one of those animals that a lion just you know, takes easily. They, can, they are able to attack a lion. I have seen them chase you know, a lion you know, far away. I've seen them chase a leopard. I've chased them, you know, chase a cheetah. So they're very, very tough, they're not easy to go for warthogs. Uh, the eland has, I think, has picked up our, my, my voice and you can tell He's not relaxed anymore. And uh, over here, who do we have? A black-headed heron. Definitely, there must be water nearby, or there's some grasshoppers, or uh, you know, little creepy crawlies. This area can be very mushy, and when it dries up, um, which sometimes is not for very long, you know, mudfish, catfish are left burrowed under where there's water. And so these guys sometimes know they'll come and using their legs and in the long beaks you know probe and get them this giraffe looks very very you know pregnant 
um, you know, they carry the young for about 14 months. Yeah, and they give birth in a very secluded spot. So I would say she's carrying a you know, a young, and definitely it's a female. Yeah, I'm gonna move further. I'm trying to find some, you know, so I have a wild beast. So I'll see you down the road. We have some lovely trees that we're going to chat about. And the reason I've been looking at the trees is because there's possibly a python in one of them. Copy, thanks so much. So this python is in a... Oh, I was just about to quiz you on... <laughs> I almost said its name. Hopefully you didn't catch on. So this uh, tree is one of the oldest lived trees that we get here in Juma. You can see it has very specific bark, very old, very thick trunk now. And it has small leaves. It is very, very, very dense and it does fall into the Cumbretum family. Remember we spoke about bush willows, red bush willows, russet bush willows. This tree also falls into that category. But the word bush willow is not in its common name. Its common name refers to the density of its wood and it is a protected tree. So you cannot drive over leadwoods, you cannot take them down. Ah, I... <sighs> Never mind, that was a horrible quiz, guys. I just gave you the answer. I, st I like, built it up so much, oh my goodness. So much. <laughs> but you all guessed leadwood anyway, so well done, everyone. Okay, 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 I give you something harder. What about these ones down here? Let's do these ones. We have looked at these before on drive. Do not say its name. Do not say its name, Trishala. Do not say its name. It has thick, <laughs> thick club shaped leaves. It has tiny little flowers that are now falling to the ground and creating puddles or piles of confetti underneath them. It has protective structures. Try not to say the name. And it doesn't grow much taller than this. Its leaves are green as opposed to its relatives, which are slightly more gray green. So, if you know this tree, give them one last zoom in there so you get a good look at the leaves. If you know this tree, hashtag Wild Earth, hashtag CGTN Wild, and tell me what it is before I mistakenly tell you what it is. <clears throat> it's always very good to test our viewers by asking about any questions and memorology and which tree that could be or which bird that be. Now, I came to the river. I haven't been to the river since morning and I thought I'll just have a little change and come close to the Mara River. And very luckily, if you look on the other side of the bank, you can see some pretty good size herd of wildebeest and zebras. Now, what I want to do, I'll stay here as long as I can because you never know what this herd may decide to do. The crossings on the Mara River have no timing. You'll be surprised. We've got people who might have come here or have seen this herd early in the morning at early 6.30 and they do nothing and like, oh. I don't think they're going to cross, you go home. They turn around, someone comes here, and in five minutes, they cross. 
So the key thing here for most of us is just to be patient. That's the Mara River. You can see loads of hippos on the bank. Getting a bit of vitamin D. And because it's not very hot, that's why you see those hippos out there warming themselves. Descendant, you like to know whether people do help uh, injured animals in the Mara. And if maybe you're asking, say, for example, game rangers, are they involved, or vet doctors, are they involved in this? In the Mara, we try to do the best we can. If, for example, an animal could have gotten injured naturally by accident on its own, falling in a hole, or they were fighting, we always let go. But if there's a concern of human wildlife conflict, say, snaring or using cables or people fought an animal that came to their village or to their garden. Yes, that particular time, we'll call in the vets to come and intervene because there was a hand of a human being in it. But in general, if no human wildlife conflict in any situation, we let it go and we leave nature to run itself. Pretty good question there. So, Mara River, for those of you who could be joining us now, and remember, we are coming to you live, and should you have any questions or comments, please don't be shy, send them through, hashtag CGTN World or hashtag World Earth. One of the longest rivers we got in the Mara and Serengeti ecosystem, and when this river dries, we always know there's a bit, not a bit, there's a major concern in this, uh, two, in this one ecosystem here. Because all the hippos you see here will unfortunately uh, die. In the same water, we got crocs, but crocs somehow will always survive by you know making this themselves some homes on the riverbank and make some kind of nests where they stay until maybe uh, the weather conditions improve and then they'll always come out. The grass you see in front of your screen is called the elephant grass. It gets tall and tall, and even the elephant, as they suggest, we rarely eat it. Not very nutritious at all. Not even these hippos here, who are very good grazers. A group of hippos that you could call it a school or a blot, could be anything 10, 15, 20 together, and more often than not, most of them will be females. They could be a few young bulls, but mainly with one dominant uh, male in that particular group. I'm not sure what that one is trying to do there, either licking the soil there. I'm not sure I'm trying to get minerals or something. You can't know, but ideally hippos are herbivores, so either is enjoying the taste uh, of the beach there. So we'll stick around and wait for the birds of the will be sent zebras we showed you earlier and see if you're lucky we'll see them cross uh, this river. Well here the more beautiful. I was about to say the name again. Somebody needs to stop me. Here's the beautiful plant which I have quizzed you. <laughs> Tim, you say it is a jackalberry. Thank you very much for your efforts, Tim. It is not. Closer look here if you want. Big leaves. There's some uh, spikes here. Snow leopard, you say it's a silver cluster leaf. It is not a silver cluster leaf. This seems to be the Can sort of... Fish coming for Lee? Let's speak to Lee quick. Standing by. Are you on this, uh, Negative, but I am in the Mulwati. Okay, 
So there's red at the tip of the spike there. Mm hmm Are we getting close, everyone? I've given away a lot of clues. No well, you say a bush willow. No, no well, not a bush willow. Perhaps this will jog your memory of the last time that we spoke about it. Oh, Judy H. I knew you were going to get it, Judy H. Judy H is right. It is a red spike thorn. It smells lovely. Lovely. And uh, Judy H is absolutely correct. Gymnosporia senegalensis. Red spike thorn. Congratulations, Judy H, but I must say I didn't expect any less. Anyway, we said we were looking for the python in the Mowati. It seems that everybody's trying to find this python because there are so many cars in the Mowati, everyone looking up into the Leadwoods, which is what we were doing initially when I gave away that clue. So we're going to continue and hopefully find the python and maybe have, you know, a leopard walk into that sighting or something like that. That's what I think. Thank you very much. Oh, a lovely spike thorn here. Maybe I should just have a, a quick look, see here. Because I see the vehicles behind me looking into the street. But I see nothing just yet. Well, hopefully we'll find this python. And when you do, when we do, you'll be back with us. Thanks, Trish. Well, we've moved on from our lions, everybody, because they weren't doing too much. And so we've gone and done this thing in the world, and it's on the herd of buffalo. It is not actually the easiest of animals to track, because they leave behind them an enormous amount of tracks, and it's amount of poo. And if you could probably almost find them just by using your nose. That's what lions do. Tell me when you're happy, Theo. Just getting out. They've moved off probably about a kilometer. Have, probably about a kilometer from the prad. This is the herd that the lions were hunting this morning. Let's have a little look at them, shall we? The Cape Buffalo. Those are the horns I was talking about earlier, and they're glinting in the sunshine. And they would have been more mobile than that a little while ago. And now, getting to the time of day where it's getting quite warm, you can expect them to be sort of lying down and ruminating. And all of here is indeed a whole lot of buffalo in the shade, taking it easy. Crazy glare stare indeed. And they look at you with that onerous sort of look, don't they? It's like, what do you want? Why are you here? Are you a danger to us? They're not threatened by it. But you look a buffalo or two looking around and Lions would need to isolate an individual from the herd, and uh, that can be rather tricky. They would definitely try and get the easiest yet, but uh, when lions start hunting, and the youngsters somehow vanish in the herd, and the big bull bulls use come together to feed the lions, and one buffer bull. Standing its ground against them is formidable. An army of them is impossible. What so try and do is get the herd to run, because when confusion, individuals get baited. You can imagine like an organized army, if we go back to the Run Lesions back in the early, early years, 
When they stood their ground with their shoes raised and poised, they were formidable. Ever they were freaks out and turn and rat. Uh, their shield wall would have dropped beers, wouldn't have been as effective, and individuals been picked off one by one. This is what buffalo do. They often stand, but then from time to time they get and run, and that is the opportunity and so looking for. There they go. I just found those guys, and they are they are disappearing now, um, off you know, my our reach. They are the few that are heading towards the river. I'm still trying to head towards where we can find, you know, some. So I'm gonna drive on and see what I can find for you ahead, right here. I'm at the marsh and there is nothing much happening so I'm gonna move on towards the open fields up this way and hopefully we can find something up there, um, some wildebeest. They prefer much shorter grass and uh, yeah hopefully you know I can get to show you um, before the end of the show. Yeah so yeah join me. but there are herds of elephants that are down in Lovu Dam. So we've still got um, my favourite herds. Of they to have joined in with us, although they, they're feeding together, but they've kept a bit of distance between one another. Of course, there's audio breakup. Sorry about that. Um, perhaps they're just going to continue for one another. But while they're drinking, there's an actual um, sort of a separation between the two. But once they start mud wallowing and dust bathing, we'll see how they interact with one another. Perhaps they did originate from the same herd at some point and um, and split up. Who knows? Who knows? This is not the gap I was talking about. That's just the other elephants can. Yeah. But there they all go. I also think that whoever dropped that sort of whether it was afterbirth, whether it's part of the placenta, I don't know. It was very intact though. I'm, I'm not sure as to what happened there. I'm not a vet either, so it seems that I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty. Yes, we'll try to reposition and get a better view. Hello everybody, welcome back to Juma and our herd of Cape Buffalo. Now, get time of day when, as I said, they're all going to be taking it easy. Uh, none of them, apart from a couple, a couple seem to be chewing, but most of them still seem to be a little bit on edge. Um, but as it is, lions hunt these individuals all the time, so they get over it pretty quickly. They get hunted by lions all day long since the day they were born. So they're constantly moving away from lions. It's a herd of buffalo is very vigilant in that regard. There's always someone looking and then they respond to the sort of threat and often that is to stampede and run away which is sometimes what the lions try and take advantage of but old bulls that you'd find in these herds that eventually leave the herd because of the amount of pressure there's a lot of pressure in here lots of pushing lots of shoving lots of competition lots of testosterone in the young bulls eventually older bulls they just get so over it that they move off or they get left behind and those are the individuals that the lions really really have a good time picking off because they're nowhere near as vigilant they're often on their own or in very small groups and they're normally pretty big guys but they're also a little bit grumpy maybe a little bit older and not in peak condition and so slowly but surely over time lions will keep picking off those individuals so it's a natural sort of order of things they will selectively remove buffaloes from these herds individuals that 
move away from the herd, individuals that get isolated. And in that regard, it's how herding mentality came about. Those that stuck together were more successful than those that went off on their own. This is a nice big bull here right in front of us. Look at these horns. He's a prime breeding bull. Look at that boss on top of his head. That is called the boss because he is the boss. And so these prime bulls in the herd are constantly pushing and shoving each other. And eventually that, that pushing and shoving just gets a bit too much. And uh, so, as I was saying, the herd mentality of sticking together is a prime directive of predator pressure. The animals that stick together are more likely to survive than those that go off on their own. And in saying that, those that go off on their own have less chance of successfully reproducing. And so, hence, that trait of herd mentality is passed on. Anything that is more successful generally reproduces more and traits like that see these bulls all these guys here all about pushing and shoving there's another really big bull and so two guys like that would actually form quite a close bond in this herd and when they finally get a little bit too old a little bit too uh, sort of out of uh, condition versus the younger guys they will move off together as a group and hang out together and protect themselves against lions but slowly but surely their age starts to play against them and lions will pick them off <laughs> Helen it does look like a judge's wig doesn't it uh, the one on the right that one he's constantly been scratching it against trees they scratch and rub against anything they possibly can and uh, not only are they the boss, they're the judge, aren't they? And a big bull like that, with that big neck, that big body, and those horns is able to pick a lioness or a lion up and flick it 10 feet in the air easily, very, very easily, with a flick of the head. So you can imagine the pressure that's exerted on them when they fight, and they are very, very capable of absolutely destroying a lioness or lion, and hence why we spoke about the dangers of trying to hunt buffalo. Oh yeah, you don't take chances uh, with goats. They are very dangerous animals. <laughs> Excuse me, the village you come from, we got two animals that we respect or that we fear, and buffaloes are uh, some of them, plus of course the hippos that you see on your screen there. We have still remained by the river. We have seen a small little herd of zebras moving towards the right of your screen and not sure what they want to do. You remember we said earlier, the whole idea here is to be patient. And of course, just like us, we got other people who have come to witness this big spectacle of the Mara migration. It could be wildebeest crossing the river or even the zebras. That's the lead one there. If they come to the river for a drink or come cross, drink, they quench their thirst, and turn around, who knows? But notice carefully how she comes very close and stops because she is not sure. She knows what could be in that water. And of course, crocodiles, she doesn't want to kill any chances. Hippos, no big deal. I mean, they're not worried about hippos. Do you want cross? So you're gonna take your life fast. You need to have lots of, uh, uh, there she goes, a lot of courage just to leave the whole group and go out fast. You can see how they're coming in down that small row here. And there's a good number. And I'm very convinced there's a possibility now they may cross. It's the hard we saw before. And they swing around that little bush and that's where they are. So they need to drink and build some pressure from behind and look at that sighting. I'll just pause for a couple of seconds just for you to digest and see that.
This is what I call beautiful. When I was in college, I was doing a bit of French and I would call this magnifique. Now, any slight sign of a crock, that's exactly what happens. On the other side of the river, it could be a lion or lioness laying ambush. We've got two that are not very far from where we are, but they're so full, I doubt even they'll be able to run and try and catch uh, this wildebeest or zebras having a drink and trying to cross this very dangerous river that's called the Mara. Well, and just like you, ladies and gentlemen, me here and Bungay, who is on the camera, we are saying double wow, because to see the wildebeest and the zebras together and having a third species, the hippos, it is so very special. Excuse me, what you're hearing. And what you're hearing in the background there, uh, those are hippos, but I'm also looking in the front of the screen and that one to me looks like a crocodile. And if it is, I'm surprised. She is not bothered, but you never know. See how she blends in? Well, she might surprise us. There's one that particular zebra looking at her. And see how close, I'm looking at one, let me see. Less than two meters apart. Either she's too full, she's too lazy, or I'm not sure what could be the problem because that's very close food right there on the table. She just needs to get some silverware and start eating. We've known crocs doing what you call a death roll and what they do possibly if she's going to make that decision is just to jump on the neck on either the zebra or the wildebeest and just toss it around in the water rolling with it and drowning it i'm so surprised that she is not bothered When you'd like to know why they migrate uh, through this dangerous river. Now, for them to reach the destinations they need to do, will have the river on their way. And they have no ways about it. It's not optional. It's not debatable. They have to cross the river. Otherwise, they will not have gotten enough food that they want. So they will come from the south of us, from where we are, from Serengeti National Park in Tanzania, come north. Uh, west and more in a clockwise like direction and then cross the Mara River, go further north to some area that you call the Loita Plains, eat as much as they can and by, the, by that time most of them are pregnant and then make a U-turn and start heading back uh, southwards. To do the same, the same river is on the way for them. They still have to cross the river so they have no choice apparently for them to make uh, the, the two ends meet, or to get to the destination, the river is always on their way. Most of them pay a very big price. And there's a heart there, it's just waiting. And once in a while we've seen that the zebras, sometimes if they're together with the little beast, they'll always take the lead. No guarantee, but more often than not, if both, both species are together, zebras always will risk their lives first. Well, Megan, we have seen once in a while, if a croc decides to catch a zebra, not much chance. Sorry, Megan, I kept quiet a little bit for you to hear uh, that beautiful sound from the hippos. And I've seen once where a crocodile caught a leg 
I mean, a neck of a zebra, and another huge, I would say, male stallion came and kicked the crocodile from the back, from the tail. And I think, you know, the, the, the crocodile was very uh, surprised or to know what was happening behind it, and it let the zebra go. But ideally, that's one of the best defenses uh, for zebras, Megan, to kick very hard, apart from, of course, the obvious speed when they take off. Now, see the crocodile now is more exposed and I'm looking at her. He is facing us. He is facing the wrong direction and maybe what he, she wants to do is for the zebras to come towards her mouth because as soon as she turns the other way to try and catch one of them, they will take off. I'm very convinced that's why she has not done anything. Otherwise, those zebras are honestly very close to her. Ah, uh, Moa, wonderful to hear your name, and I really like your comment that this crocodile is a bit choosy, and what she wants is a wildebeest, not a zebra. It is very possible. I mean, sometimes we have always thought when it comes to reaction when predators are involved, zebras are a little faster than the will be now there. Zebras are a little faster than the will be. Maybe that could be the reason. But look very carefully now. We've got two crocs that are coming. Let's just all watch in front of the zebras drinking. We've got two crocs just coming. Apparently, they blend in very well in the water. And if you look, the eyes are right on the edge of the water level. And I still do not think these zebras have seen them. But let's just wait and see. The other croc is still where it was before, blending in very well. And I can tell you for a fact, uh, I do not think, not for a fact, but I do not think those zebras have an idea how clo close uh, that crocodile is. Now, the other two crocs cannot come a little closer than that because I think the water level there is a bit low. And once they do that, they're going to expose themselves. So what they will do is to remain there and hopefully wait for more zebras to come back in the water. How exciting is this? And remember, we are coming to you live from the Masai Mara of Kenya. Should you have any questions or comments, please send them through. Tweet, hashtag CGTN World or hashtag World Earth. Now, not all the zebras, the wildebeest have had a drink. So got a feeling we'll have more coming back. Some are nudging others. Come on, guys, let's cross, let's do it. I had a question there about how zebras kick, and you've just seen that's exactly what they do, but that I would say it's more of a play kick than an actual fight, because I would guess they are all related, same family here. And I'm telling you, these animals are true. They're very, very nervous. I mean, they know what is ahead of them. And it's a difficult decision to make. And many times we have called the Mara River the, the river of life and at the same time, uh, the river of death. Having those zebras drinking there earlier is the river of life for them. Hippos got a home. Crocs, this is their ecological niche. They got a home too, so that's the river of life. But when they cross, and unfortunately we get crocs bringing them down, or we got lions bringing them down on the, uh, the other end, the river changes its name to the river of death. It depends on what side of the coin you're looking at on a particular moment. Patience is very key here. You would imagine, should a predator come from the bushes behind them, I can tell you all of them will scamper across in the river because nobody will want to be caught by the would be predator. So far, so good. And I'm looking at the place they would cross to the other side of the riverbank. It's very soft gradient. They will cross very, very easily. They can actually even walk through. 
Notice the hippos, unless something happens, they never bothered with any other habit of like scaring the water. You see, once a white concerns, when maybe they see big animals like elephants or rhinos coming to drink, but anything below that size, you know, zebras, wildebeest, some antelopes, normally they have no issues. Brent, very good to hear your name and you're saying this is the river of life and death and that is very, very true because it could also be the same river for life because the source of this river is somewhere in the Rift Valley of Kenya and it passes through homes and villages and most of the villagers there will always get their water from this river. So definitely uh, is the river of life but then it comes through the Masai Mara of Kenya and the bigger part goes through Serengeti then back to the Mara and all the way to the Lake Victoria and in every place it goes through where we got human settlement this is where they source their water then naturally it becomes the river of death because of all what happens not sure how many of you were watching the other day when we had so many will be trying to cross the river and they couldn't make it on the other end and through the stampede many of them died the clock here not sure it's swimming to go to the other end i am not leaving this location i'll be here as long as it takes Well, that sounds very exciting, but it's also all happening here. We should, and hopefully our signal will be a little bit better. Entire herd, they're just standing around, not doing much right now. They've had a drink, some have had a wallow, and the others I think are maybe just, just having a five-minute siesta. So I spoke to a friend of mine who is a wildlife vet and um, <clears throat> sent him those pictures and a voice note of what I saw with, um, of course, that stuff that was on the ground that we got out and showed you. And he said to me that it looks like a normal, healthy placenta. Um, there, are, there is no newborn elephant here, but maybe the, if it is from an elephant, like I said, it could be from two species, either an elephant or a, a rhinoceros, because those were the tracks that were around. Um, there were no giraffe tracks, there were also no buffalo tracks about. Um, but, but he also agreed that it's from a, it's from a large animal. Um, so you, we're going to have to just keep our eyes open, which is very exciting. Um, and maybe we will either find a little elephant. Maybe she's just obviously a newborn elephant is not going to be able to walk as quickly as a herd of elephants that wants to quench their thirst. So maybe she's just sticking to the thicket. Um, but yeah, but very exciting. And he also added, he said that, that the afterbirth of placenta can sometimes take up to 30 minutes to 10 hours um, to be ejected from from the female so very interesting stuff so I thought that that was quite cool but he said definitely healthy he says he's very he's 100% certain that there should be a little animal around he said the other option is that maybe um, the it was well a dead what am I trying to say the baby was unfortunately not alive and that it had been eaten but then we would have seen more I think more predator activity I've seen some vultures coming on in but they could have just seen that placenta now and maybe they're going down to that because it is wide out and in the open and vultures have exceptional eyesight but um anyway so that that's quite cool so it'll give um, us something to do for the next few days we can play a game of find the baby rhino or baby elephant which could be very cool but it is lovely 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 morning here with all of these gentle giants just enjoying themselves it's so peaceful Right, it seems as though the action is happening back on the edges of the Mara River, so off we go to see the zebra take a dive. Well, it's very true. Action could be happening here. I don't know what just spoke to those animals and they've just gone the other direction. This happens, but I can tell you they will not go very fast. You see the dust they've blown there? 
and especially the wild beast. If any one of them would sense something that's not right, that's exactly how they behave. Even if a small little scrub here, a small little dick dick, a small little animal, and I think, ooh, that looks like a cat. Ooh, that looks like a predator. They just take off. But then the thing is, they'll go, and most likely they're gonna go to where we had seen them before. They may go around that way, and then after some time, they'll come back here. Again, as I said, patient is very important. That was quite entertaining though. They remain in those thickets there that you see because of course it's cool and then afterwards they'll have the courage to make, make a decision to come back to the river. Which the hippos have remained put where they were. It's basking out on the riverbank and enjoying the sunshine being semi-aquatic animals. But of course, when it gets much hotter, all of them will be back to the water. It's always very good to hear these zebras when they communicate, and more often than not, uh, it will be the stallions or the males maybe trying to pass particular messages that you may never understand. And like, ooh, we had a close shave there. Ooh, we almost got brought down by whoever it was. But who knows what they're saying. But wonderful language or wonderful calls they make. See the crocs still in the same place. Again, I'm staying here, waiting to see what will happen. Welcome back everybody to Unbeyond Panda, where we've just recently discovered a relatively old Nyana carcass, which I think the mother of those three young male lions that we saw yesterday managed to, to successfully hunt. And there are a couple of vultures that have come down now. She saw a batelier and these vultures must have seen them that have come down to investigate. They're all sort of hanging around this watering hole, which as we got here was like an oasis of animals. There were two rhino that were here, warthog that came down to wallow, uh, warthog that would drink. The one yeah, caked itself in mud and it had a bit of an itchy back and yeah, just trying to get rid of that. It wallowed in the mud. There were impala, zebra, and these vultures now. Just waiting, they might come. I think when we move off to have a bit of a drink themselves, it is a really hot morning now. Not much wind at all, but very busy bird wise. Uh, for the first time now, I've just seen some orange breasted wax bulls come, come down to, to drink. They are really pretty little birds. I'm hoping that while we sit here patiently, they might just make an appearance again. And if I show you here in the book, I'll show you what we've been, been looking at, is that bird over there, the orange red wax bull. A very, very pretty little bird that, that's come down to, to drink. And there are a lot of quilia as well now, but when the quilia take off, everything seems to take off and that was the first time that I've seen that orange breasted wax bull uh, eat mostly seeds and insects but have a look now those vultures have come back or out into the open these white backed vultures and I was just chatting to Craig it almost looked like that one was about to take off there just chatting to to Craig behind the camera about it when they take off because it takes a lot of effort Oh my goodness, what a great morning for everybody all around. So, Ella having a good day. They're not completely covering themselves in mud and rolling around like they normally do. There's just sort of very gentle splashes of mud. You can see lots of safari vehicles coming to enjoy the spectacle with us. 
which is quite nice. See, we don't have anything quite as exciting as wildebeest migrating through massive river systems. Actually, it's quite nice to just see wildebeest every now and then. We've got a small herd on Impala Plains. But the thing that really gets me revved up is just seeing these elephants and seeing them in great numbers. I'm waiting for all the herd to, um, to come on back. And I reckon it won't be long before we won't be able to see any water because it will just be completely filled with elephants especially if this hot weather continues. Now that elephant is having a serious mud bath and getting extra mud from the other elephant <laughs> as it tosses it back over its head. So the other thing that was quite interesting is, um, and I know we're just looking at a group of the bulls now because they're the ones that linger the longest around a watering hole. I reckon that they'll go swim probably just after the show ends. Hopefully not. Hopefully they'll get in before that. But um, is that my young elephant friend Susan that I every now and then seen she was standing and all the bulls were very interested in her so that was nice to see and she's she's very flirtatious back so I don't know if she has mated yet but I, I think that she will at some point and then the, uh, Seb can we look at this cow that's walking in so this is the cow yesterday afternoon that Sebastian and I were talking about and we think she is also going to give birth soon she is so she's so big and um, her mammary glands are nice and full, and she's got a huge bulge from um, the side of her. And you can see that's her older calf there. That's probably around closer to four years old or so. It's actually quite big. I don't think it's going to have ma massive tusks. It's not a little elephant. So maybe maybe three and a half, four years old, somewhere around there. But um, so that's about the right time. It's, I suppose it varies slightly every three to four years or four to five years, maybe a bit more than that. You have to take into lots of different things into account, like has there been a drought, is there enough food available, and that type of thing. Otherwise, the um, the gaps between, or well, the intervals between their calves could be a little bit longer. So another elephant to watch, and she's quite easy to identify because on her left tusk, we can't see it now, but there's a nice big notch, but she's also a really big girl. Mm, it's always a one with the elephants. They're always up to something. They, only every now and again do you spend time sleeping. And when they do, it's a very special scene. Here our whole buffalo herd has decided to lie down all over the place. So I don't want to disturb them by going any closer. So we are here with this old bull who's all on his own. A little bit away from the herd. I think he's a bit grumpy. It's been a very long night for him. He's not very happy with how things went, I suppose. He's just tucked in a very small bit of shade. The rest of the herd all around. I wonder if you can hear all the noises. everybody all the noises we can hear around this buffalo herd it's just going to be quiet let you hear the sounds of the ox pickers you can probably hear all those chirping sounds those are the ox pickers they are birds very commonly found on mammals, especially mammals with ticks and the buffalo are littered with ticks, many many ticks on their bodies and um, those ox peckers feed on the ticks exclusively, almost exclusively and uh, it's quite an important sign. Ox peckers will actually lead you to herds like this and if you are aware to it and your ears are open and help you find buffer and also help save your life if you happen to be on a walk. The ox pickers you'll hear long before the buffalo, or well, sometimes. Buffalo aren't always out there making lots of noise, but the birds are non stop chattering. And 
What a beautiful morning it has been. I hope you've enjoyed yourselves with us out in the African wilds this morning. I know I certainly have enjoyed bringing you myself as well as all the other guides bring you wonderful scenes from around South Africa and the Maasai Mara it has been abounding with wildlife and activity. I do hope you've enjoyed spending time with us on this sunrise safari. We will be coming to you live from all of our locations again tomorrow, same time, same place. And we do thank you for all of your questions and comments. We look forward to guiding you once again in the morning. Who knows what we might find? The African wilderness is a wild and wonderful place where absolutely anything can happen. Until tomorrow, have a good day everybody. Goodbye.